Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. All right, we're up and running. Money Mendez, what's well, up? Good what's to see up? you, brother. Yeah, thanks Finally, for man, me. we've been talking about doing this a long time. Too long, oh, bro. Jesus. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that, Jamie. We splattered. I tried to uh, push the plunger down on the uh, French press, and it it splattered everywhere. So if my microphone explodes, <laughs> we know why. Sorry, right, this uh, this table needed a little seasoning. Needed some color. I'm gonna throw one over here. I'll get this. Though. It's all right. So uh, what's happening, man? How you doing? How's the retirement life? Oh man, well, retirement from fighting, yeah. but not, but maybe not really. No, man, I'm actually more busy now, not fighting. I'm actually uh, want to get back into the training part of it so it can slow down a little bit. But it's been good, dude. It's uh, we got a ton of stuff going on, a lot of stuff on the plate. My wife's about to kill me, but. <laughs> <laughs> but we got some shit going. <laughs> what for you working too much? Too much, man. Way too much. But it's good, man. I, I you know, after fighting, I had to channel that like that energy of getting shit going and and being successful somewhere. I almost felt like I jumped into a little bit of a depression there for like a couple weeks after cuz I had like no sense of doing, you know. Right. And so I was like, fuck it, I'm going to start just trying to grow a couple brands and, and building a couple companies and see what happens. So I was like honed all my energy onto that stuff and uh, uh, it definitely took over. So it's it's been nice. It's been fun being able to just basically channel that stuff into that and let it rip. It's one of the most difficult things for a fighter is the stopping fighting, but you don't know what to do with all mm -hmm. this intense energy that you've been focusing your whole life in one way. And now all of a sudden, I and mean, for a lot of fighters, it's like their whole identity, right? It is, man. Like, I, I started wrestling when I was five years old. Like, I, I wrestled from five years old every single year up and through college. And then the day after graduation, drove up to Faber's, fucking lived in his, uh, I lived in his spare room and started training, trained for three months and had my first pro fight and then just basically never stopped. Went up, never stopped. And wow. so it's like when you have that identity of of an athlete and then that's like your routine that's what you do like when i stopped i was just like dude what am i doing <laughs> like what do i do with my life like, I, and how I, old are you now at 36 i just turned 36 in may so you're still in this like athletic zone yep. where you're still you know until you're in once you're around 40 people start going man yeah time to do something else Mm -hmm. But 36, it's like, I'm, man, Anderson was in his prime at 36. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, unless you're Dan Hendo right. or even Couture, but those are freaks. Those are, well, f f Couture didn't even start his career, I think, until he was 35. Yeah. I, I want to say he might have been, it was 34 or 35 with his first UFC fight. Yeah. It's crazy. Let's find out what that is. Find out. It's like 1997. I was there for it. That was the tournament. And it was... Uh, it was the same weekend that Tito Ortiz had his first fight. Guy Metzger had his first fight. Um, like Tito beat Wes Albright. Yeah. I don't know how I remember that. And then he fought Guy, and Guy tapped him out. Guy caught him in a guillotine. Yep, I remember watching those. Yeah, I, I remember going to um, uh, Blockbuster. Do you remember Blockbuster? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Me and my brothers would ride over there on our on our bikes, and I'd go straight to the the section that had all the VHS for the UFC yeah. events. Right get, next to like Faces of Death. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'd grab as many as we could, take them home and sit there and just watch them for yeah. hours. Yeah, man, it was I cool. remember, I, I believe it was UFC 2 was the only one that was available. I, I, I believe you couldn't get UFC 1 on VHS for a while. Yeah. Because I think Hori and Gracie owned it or something. I, I don't might know, be wrong yeah. about that, yeah. It would have been like turning 34 that year. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. Months, like a month yeah. after. That's there crazy, man. Yeah, 34, starting his career, and goes on to become the light heavyweight and the heavyweight one champion. One of the best in the world, yeah. One of the best ever, and then fights, like, well, for more than 10 years. So this is 97. When did he retire from the UFC? I thought he was, like, 43 or 40. Man, I mean, he fought Lyoto Machida. He was, like, he was deep in his 40s. Mm -hmm. Or in his 40s. He wouldn't have been closer to 50. Would he have been? He c well, when did he fight Leo? No, I can't. 2011. 2011. April 30th, 2011. Wow. Dude, yeah. That's crazy. 14. Years so, later. yeah. 
I can tell you I'm not fighting that long. So he's 48. He was 48. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, 48 when he fought Machida. Yeah, that's wild. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's r- super rare, though. Super rare. You know? Like, Bernard Hopkins was the only other guy that fought, like, at a world-class level to into his 50s. Mm-hmm. Bernard was, like, at 50. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, I hope that I feel that good to be able to compete when I'm 50, but I'll tell you what, I, I do a lot of hunting and fishing stuff with Hendo. Mm-hmm. And that guy's like, yeah, he's like a robot. He barely can move. Like Dan, and he's like, huh? <laughs> it's like, no, does he feel all right when you talk to him? Oh yeah, he's, like that guy he, still the, spars. He tells me he still spars. Does he really? Yeah, I'm like, dude, Dan, you're insane. Why yeah, is he spar? Just, it's a good workout. I'm like, Dan, I could give you like 50 other things you can do. That's a good workout that you don't have to spar, get punched in the head. But he's so <laughs> stiff. It's like, uh, is he stiff because he's just stiff, or is he in pain? I think he's just stiff. Even if he's in pain, he would never tell no. you. No, he's the, got the cauliflower thing. hands. I like look at his hands sometimes, <laughs> and I'll just grab them, and I'm like, "Dude," and yeah. they they just feel hard, like harder than most people's bones, like in their hands. Well, all like, of what? Dan's body feels weird. Yeah, like when you put your hand on his back, it's like mahogany. Yeah, it's like, like what are you fucking it's made just out of? Petrified oak? wood. Yeah, <laughs> he's not. He doesn't feel like a regular person. No. I talked to the lady that massaged him. She goes, "I have never met someone more dense." Yeah. He is like he's dense. just dense. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's crazy. Well, but... that's where he got all that power too. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, his whole body's just fucking. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's, he's solid. He's an odd dude. He is. I love him. He's an amazing, <laughs> amazing person. I mean, you got to realize this guy competed uh, as a heavyweight and knocked out Fedor. Remember that, oh, right? Yeah. Like, that's and crazy. that was when Fedor was still Fedor. This is like Fedor's still fighting, right? But this was like more than ten years ago. This is in Strike Force. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, we we sat and watched uh, a bunch of those highlights from a lot of those fights. Uh, we were over at my buddy Chad Belding's house, and we were doing some filming and stuff. And we just sat down, and everybody just kind of quit what they're doing and just watched that dude just KO dude after dude. And it's, <laughs> everybody's like, "Man, Dan," because like a lot of the girls that work there and stuff that help us, they don't. I don't think they really understand who Dan Henderson is. Right. And they're just watching this stuff on TV, and they're like, "Jesus." Dan's just like, uh, uh. <laughs> it's like uh, you know, it's like, I love the guy to death. Man. He's, he's quite a character. Yeah. He's quite a character and a, a real pioneer. I was there for his first fight, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, I think his first fight was versus Alan Goez. If that wasn't his first fight in, I mean, in the UFC, it was mm-hmm. one of the first fights. And I, I think he was in like a tournament with Alan Goez. Yeah. I remember him talking about that. I, yeah. I missed it. I didn't see it. But, he told me, if I remember right, um, he beat he beat someone. And Carlos then the, crowd, the crowd got really upset by the call, and there was people yeah. storming the cage or the ring. I, I think remember. that was the Alan Goas fight. Yeah, people yeah. were pissed. Yeah, yeah, that was a. I don't remember the fight enough mm-hmm. to comment on the decision. But I think some people were pissed at it. Mm-hmm. But you know, that's one thing that's never changed: shitty decisions. Oh, I mean, yeah. they they still exist. You know, Francis Ngannou had a very good point the other day that there should be some protection for fighters because you know, losing half of your purse mm-hmm. because someone made a bad call. There should be a way that's, around that. That's funny you say that because I years ago was talking with a buddy of mine and we were thinking of like an insurance plan for fighters mm-hmm. just for that reason right there for injuries. Like, say you're you're. Because this is the shitty thing that I don't, I mean, a lot of people probably know this, but you go through a 10 week training camp, and this has happened to me multiple times in my fight and, and some fights where the week before the fight, your, your opponent gets injured. They back out, they can't find anybody to fill in, and now your fight doesn't happen. Right. Well, guess what? You just went through all that training, paying your trainers, you know, you still got to pay managers and everything for, yep. for every, everything they do work wise. You don't get paid. Yeah. So you're just like, damn it, man. And, and for some fighters, if you get months. injured after that, you're talking, I mean, look, what if you tear an ACL after yeah. that? Then you're a year and a half out. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, it's a hard world. Mm-hmm. It's a hard world. I wish somebody would come up with, I don't have the capacity now to do it, but <laughs> I think it would be a smart business move and it would be cool for fighters to have for sure. Well, you know, there was a lot of uproar this weekend because of, uh, who's the gal that was in the, uh, co event who won and then she got the $50,000, uh, yeah, I win saw, bonus. I saw the videos. Let's see if uh, she pull up her, her name and people were really mad at the UFC because of her reaction because it changed her life. Mm-hmm. And it, 
Go ahead. Was this the same girl that I saw started a GoFundMe page or something? Did she? I remember seeing there was a female fighter that started a GoFundMe page. I don't know. And it could be her. I don't know. But I did see the video of her where she's like taking a drink of her Coke and then yeah. just like yeah. hits the ground. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So go back up. Good. So, yeah. Cheyenne buys Banks a bonus for UFC 33 co-main event finish. So it was a beautiful finish. The, she, she caught the girl with a head kick and then finished her off. It, w- it was pretty awesome. But afterwards, they were talking about fighter pay, mm-hmm. you know, and she was, uh, she was crying. And, and then all these people got online and they started complaining about the UFC. And I, I, see, I, I see everybody's point. I see their point and I also see the UFC's point because – a lot of people don't know who she is yet. I mean, they know who she is more now, but the whole thing about this sport is how many people are going to watch you fight. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. How exciting are you? How entertaining are you? Uh, How engaging are you, your personality? And do you put asses in the seats? I mean, it's clear now, you know, who puts asses in the seats, and those are the people that get the most money. Yep. And it's... um, it's it's a complicated thing for people, you know, because they think, well, the best fighter should make the most money. And you go, yeah, but the best fighter doesn't put the most asses in the seats. Mm-hmm. And that's what this game is all about. It's a yeah. weird sport, it, right? It's it, like, yeah. it's prize fighting, but it's also entertainment. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it is tough for a lot of guys because bottom line, you know, you could be the best in the world. I'm gonna, I I hate using this as an example because I love the guy, Demetrius Johnson. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, was one of the best UFC fighters to ever, ever, ever. Stand, stand in there. Of all time. But it's like- If he, not the best. He, for whatever reason, and it's probably because, and I feel like I'm kind of the same way. We're not shit talkers. We're not guys that cause that drama and make things dramatic. We just want to get in there, compete, and kick someone's ass and go yeah. have some fun doing other things that we enjoy. And, uh, you know, it, I don't think he he moved the needle at all, you know, and, and people were saying that. So he was also 125 pounds. Exactly. And that's I think a, that's, that's another a, issue, too. Not a an big issue, issue, but it's, a, you know, it's it's something people want to see these big guys just go in there and K- KO people bottom line. But, yeah. Isn't it interesting? Because 135 is really popular. Mm-hmm. It's only 10 pounds. I know. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand it. But but it's it's weird. It's like you can't be the smallest. Mm-hmm. You can be the second smallest, <laughs> and everybody's like, "All right, I'm all in yeah. with these band weights." <laughs> like that fucking T.J. Dillashaw yeah. Sanhagen fight from last weekend was Jesus. amazing. Man, amazing. Uh, T.J. was supposed fight. to come do our tuna trip, our fins and feathers tuna trip, and we knew it was a fifty fifty chance that you know whether he had broken hands or something right. that he wouldn't be able to come, but. His knees mangled, right? Oh, yeah. He had to have surgery, and he sent Did he pictures. have the surgery? I think he already had surgery, yeah. How bad is it? Uh, I don't... I think I think he said it's a three-month recovery, but... Well, that's it? Yeah. I don't even know if I should be saying all this on here. Sorry, TJ, but... I Sorry, don't know TJ. If you, yeah, I don't know if you want this out or not, but... Uh, yeah, I, I know he was he was pretty mangled up from, from it. He was yeah, man. on I crutches. Mean, it looked like it was the heel hook, if I had a guess. Mm. Like, a lot of people were saying he re- wrenched it on the way out, but there's a moment where San Hagen catches him in a heel hook, mm-hmm. and he's yanking on it. And the way I'm looking at it, I'm like, man, that could rip your shit apart. Yeah, he didn't tell me what it was from. He just showed me photos of his knee mm. was just huge. His he knee, probably his barely ankle, knew. Yeah. Probably barely knew. Mm-hmm. If his ankle was fucked, too, that even lends more mm-hmm. credibility to the possibility. And it could have been opposite sides, too. I'd have mm. to look at the photos. But I do know I talked to TJ like a week before the fight, and he was like, man, this is probably the most injured I've ever been going into a fight. But he's like, fuck it. And TJ's just a tough son of a bitch. You he's know? a he's, tough motherfucker. Yeah, he's you a know, tough son of a bitch. People give him a lot of shit for that EPO thing, and, yeah. I, and he deserves it. And he'll tell you he deserves it. Yeah. But look, that motherfucker was dying making 125, like yeah. literally dying. I've mm-hmm. never seen anybody look worse walking around like when they were filming him not even the day he was making weight Mm -hmm. but like up to the day of making weight he looked like a fucking skeleton yeah i'm so i'm so against big weight cuts man yeah i fucking hate it i you know i cut tons of weight throughout college for wrestling and you know my senior year i finally just put my foot down and was like look i'm going up two weight classes i'm not cutting to 125s anymore wow i used to cut to 125s and i was making weight two times a week you know, wrestling. 
And I went up to 141s and was undefeated the entire year. My only loss came in the NCAA finals. It was the best I had ever felt. And I'm like, dude, why did I not do that my whole life? Isn't it amazing? Yeah. It's like you're doing this. I, I'm, I'm a fully against weight cutting in MMA, mm -hmm. period. And you could probably apply it to all combat sports. Because I think what it is, even though uh, there's no disrespect to anybody who does it, but I think it's sanctioned cheating. I really do, because yeah. if you're saying you're the like, let's say uh, Kamaru Usman is the 170 pound champion. Kamaru Usman weighs 170 pounds for about 20 minutes. Yeah, I mean that guy's massive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he's a solid 200 or close to it. Oh, he's a yeah. thick fella. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, he's not really 170 pounds, and that's no, no fault of his own. Everybody he fights is the same way, mm -hmm. whether it's Masvidal or you know. You know, all of them. Everybody he fights. They're all big people. Mm -hmm. You know, Tyron was a, a giant guy at 170. He was never really 170 either. No. But if they just fought at their weight class, like what they actually weigh, I think they would feel better. They'd perform better. I think you'd, you'd have a longer career. You'd probably have less injuries. More probably exciting fights. More I think. exciting fights. You'd yeah. have more energy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think. The solution is the UFC needs more weight classes. Mm -hmm. I really believe that every 10 pounds is the way to go. I, I agree. And I, I was the same way, man. I would cut to 45s, and I would put on about 20 pounds, 18 to 20 pounds. That yeah, you're night. looking thick right now, fella. <laughs> you're looking about 180. What do you weigh? <laughs> 70. Cut the shit. I'm 170. I'll bring a fucking scale out here right now. Let's do it. Look how thick you are. You look like a gorilla. <laughs> I was but, just you know, trying to be like you, Joe. When you weighed 145, man, how what how vicious was that cut for you? It was pretty brutal. I mean, I walked around, you know, when I was making weight consistently and training consistently, you know, two, sometimes even three times a day. Uh, dude, I walked around like 168, 165 Oof. to 168, and I was cutting down to 45s. And how would you do it? How many pounds would you lose day of weighing? Usually I would try to get down to about five the day of and I would cut all water weight five to six sometimes even so would you just really restrict your diet the week of yeah I mean I, I'd say probably I mean I ate pretty clean throughout um, about three weeks out I really started cutting back on portion size and then look at you Jesus Christ son shredded <laughs> lean shredded <laughs> yes I, yeah I haven't looked like that in a while bro 2014 <laughs> Well, well, that's the funny thing is that's what everybody likes. They like to see people look like that, but that shit ain't healthy. No, like dude, that bodybuilder look. Like shit, yeah. They, like those I, guys are dying. Yeah, I would, I would get my ass kicked if I fought right there. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it crazy though? Because yeah. everybody thinks, thinks God, looks, he looks so amazing because yeah. <laughs> no, you can I'm see his weak. six pack. Yeah. <laughs> so tired, yeah, right? So yeah, different right see, there. There that's go. different. That's, that's, that's ready the to go. Next day, yeah, I'm all right. full of water and. I'm ready to go. Yep, yeah, ready to go. I got a full belly. Have How a much of, of a hit do, do you think it takes off of your ability to perform, though, the fact that you do do that yeah. 24 hours before? I, I, I notice it. Like I, And I almost wish that I would do this more through training camps when I was doing it, but try to do a mock cut and then try to fine-tune exactly what to eat after. Because even my entire career, I mean, I would try to have the same things that I would eat, but, you know, you don't always feel – 100% the next I don't think I ever felt 100% for any fight you know you cut that much weight you feel good but when you get in there and it's like I could go through 10 rounds of 10 five minute rounds and be just relentless in training being able to eat and be hydrated and then you get in there and obviously nerves play a big factor too but you know three rounds you're already like fuck man I feel this you know and yeah. I don't know if that's from dehydrating so much my body's just not back to full or it has you know, to have an effect. Yeah, I think it does. It has to. It mm -hmm. just has to. You know, I mean, but, it's just it's just not good for you. It's no. and it's so counterproductive. It's, it's counterintuitive. Like twenty four hours before, literally one of the most dangerous things in all of sports, mm -hmm. a cage fight. You're gonna dehydrate yourself literally to the point of death. Yeah, dude. <laughs> and I, my Frankie fight. I think I, I messed up big time. I I was using um. Uh, God, I can't remember his name. Um, it was a dietitian, which I'd never used any through any of my fights before. You that. never used any like Dolce or any of those I guys. Never did. Like I, I asked them for some advice here and there from time to time, but God, I can't remember this dude. It's uh, Lockhart. Lockhart. Yep. And used that, those guys, and it was a whole system. And there was like natural diuretics that you use, and you know, I'd never done any of that, and I just think it dehydrated my head too much or something. Like, really. I mean, if you watch the fight, Frankie like barely clipped my nose and it was just like lights out. 
Wow. You know, I've been hit, fucking bit hit by Aldo harder than that mm -hmm. and just like bounce back, you know, and it's like, I don't know. It's just one of those things. Like I never did that after. Well, but. a lot of people like when they make a cut, like Aldo's a good example, right? Like Aldo was the king at 45 forever. Now he's figured out how to get to 35 and he That's looks insane. fucking great. Yeah. It looks great at 35. But he had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. He had to dial it in, and he had to do it several times until he really got it down. Mm -hmm. And now I think he's he too. He's lost muscle, a lot of muscle mass. You mm -hmm. gotta, you have to. Like yeah. when I cut the twenty fives, like I just had. You got to do a lot of fasting, like fasted cardio, fasted workouts, to where your body's basically eating your muscle. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, you feel like shit when it's happening, but you're shrinking up. And then once you get to that point where you you know where you want to be your body kind of adjusts and gets used to it and now now that's your your size you know yeah when cam was racing when he was running um the moab 240 he, he, i forget what the exact calorie count was but what he did was he like let's say burned 3000 calories ate 2500 yeah, calories uh -huh. and i was like fuck <laughs> just hearing that made me tired uh -huh. <laughs> dude i and that's what he did He's a beast, man. That guy's such a beast. He's got discipline on top of discipline. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's a wild thing to see. I wish I could find that mindset that Cam has. Like, <laughs> how? Like, where do you find that? I don't think you can, but. Well, I mean, he's sort of cultivated it over his life, you know, and he's just made it more and more focused as he's gotten older and older mm -hmm. and, and gotten used to the grind. And it's become just a natural part of his life. But it's what's fascinating is it's self-imposed. You know, mm -hmm. it's very few people have that kind of discipline. But the only ones I know of, uh, like him, are like him and Goggins. Mm -hmm. And the difference between him is he has a full-time job, which is yeah. really crazy. It's nuts. Full-time nine-to-five job, and still has time then, to do all that other shit. And then he'll go run a marathon, yeah. right? Yeah, he'll run a marathon a day, yeah. a day. Yeah. While he's, yeah, they tell you if you run a marathon, you're supposed to take months off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to do a day, one a day. It's fucking crazy, man. I, w I think I'd give up from the foot pain. Like, I see his feet, like, going into oh. those, those big races, and I'm just like, dude. Like, I'm I'm doing some boxing training. I get a blister on my toe, and I'm like, fuck, ah, oh, man. Have you seen Goggins' feet? Oh, dude. There's a, there's a photo of, you know, there's this, this, these memes going around when I sat down next to Connor when Connor had a broken yeah, leg and I was interviewing yeah. him. It was me interviewing, like, the 9-11 Tower. And also, <laughs> it's saw. got me interviewing Goggins' feet. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen it, Jamie? If you can't find, find it, I'll, I'll send it to you, Jamie, because Dave sent it to me, and it's just, it's like, so good. it's so disgusting. His feet are so gross. Have you seen it? Not, I mean, I know the feet picture, but here I'll find it for you. It's it's so it's so ridiculous. All those memes were hilarious. It's so funny. Yeah. Here I'm gonna send it to you, Jamie. Yeah, the the internet wins always. Always undefeated. Here, Jamie. It's uh, but these feet. This is what happens when you run the kind of miles that that Goggins runs. I mean, they're so disgusting. They're so destroyed. Mm -hmm. And he keeps running on them. That's the thing. It's like, the, look at that. Oh, God. Look at those toes. Dude, no. <laughs> look at oh. his big toes. Oh. They look like they're about to fall off. Yeah, well, they're, uh, their nails are gone. There's no nails. Oh, on both of man. Them. They're cracked and destroyed. He's still on crazy long toe fingers, too, right? Yeah, look, look at that. Look how long his toes are. It's almost are. like he's got another toe coming out of the one you're interviewing. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like the fingers. Look how long they are. Yeah, dude. That dude put some miles on those yeah. fucking feet, man. That is... It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And well, he does it, too. Like, he was doing it with, like, some pretty serious meniscus damage. My friend uh, operated on him and cleaned up some of his meniscus and said his meniscus was hard like leather. He Dude. said it's like never cut through meniscus like that before. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> He's got to get a saw to cut through it. He said he bent the knife. No. Yeah, like legitimately. Dude, yeah. that's crazy. I mean, I guess those guys are just so mentally tough. It's like. He's hardening everything. Yeah. His bones, I don't meniscus, care. I feel the cartilage. Pain. I don't care. Bum, yeah. Bum, bum, it's crazy. Bum. I guess, you know, when you think about it, your body does adapt to a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. The problem is most people never push past the pain that it takes to adapt to something like that. I think that's key right there. Yeah. Yep, that's it. Did you do a lot of running when you were fighting? I did, but I did a lot of uh, road biking. I, I liked riding, just kind of zoning out and just doing, you know, 40 miles, 50 miles. Um, Better on your knees too, I right? I think so, yeah, and my lower back. I, I When I run, it's probably because I'm top heavy, but, yeah, I, I noticed my lower back gets pretty sore. Like I ran last night and it's sore today, but, you know, it's just those things that, 
the aches and pains you got to push through, you know? Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that thing that you might be doing? Yeah, let's do it. We got a big announcement. Push this microphone in front of you. That's Wait, it. You just get it. Yeah, there you go. Like that. So tell me what this is. What is this announcement? What's going on? So well, I just signed a big contract, bro. I'm coming back to fighting. Oh, no. Yeah. In the great words of TJ Dillashaw, daddy's home, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not coming back to MMA, man. Uh, I know that I've been seeing a lot of people's comment, and they're kind of hoping that I am. Um, I'm coming back to boxing, man. I want to try something different. Now, you coming back to regular boxing, or are you going to do bare-knuckle boxing? I think we're going to throw some bare-knuckle in there, bro. Just mix it up, get real crazy. Now, I've seen you. You're working out a lot. Mm -hmm. You're hitting a lot of mitts. Like, were you doing that before? Or did you just have this, did, did they contact you? Like, how did this come about? So we've, I mean, this is actually something that's kind of been in the works for probably a year now. Really? Um, you know, it's just, for me, look, I just turned 36 in May, and we were just talking about still having that that desire. Like, when I, when I left the UFC, I was just about to have my first baby. Um, you know, we had, I had a lot on my plate. There was, obviously, I j had just lost, but even going into that fight, I had started a company was working on a few other companies and there was a lot that i was more excited about than competing at the time and i mean obviously we know that this sport is so brutal like you if you don't have a hundred percent mindset into it you're gonna get fucked up you know and it's mm. for me i was like look dude i'm gonna take some time off um i'm gonna or just or just end it here i have other things going on and we'll see kind of what happens in the future so I decided to retire, talked it over with the wife, and that was, you know, what the game plan was. So uh, fast forward two and a half years later, um, you know, obviously I still have that desire. Um, and obviously my, my baby girl is bigger now. We are uh, pregnant with a second. And uh, I just started thinking like, man, I'm getting older. I don't want to get into my 40s and then basically still have this desire to compete and be like, it's too fucking late, you know. So I'm like, let's let's start talking to some of these guys. I've always wanted to box, you know, coming off of wrestling. My my style even in the UFC was boxing and wrestling were probably my two favorite things to do. Like I absolutely loved boxing, sparring when I would be training through through training camps, um, and then obviously wrestling too. But um, I always wanted to try and compete in some type of boxing competition, um, and so. Uh, bare knuckle actually reached out to Faber and was like, Hey, do you think Mendez would ever be interested in this? And I'm like, I mean, I probably never thought about anything bare knuckle before, but you know, boxing definitely would be fun. Let me ask you this about bare knuckle. Why, why do they have those like really thick wraps that go all around the hand, but just expose the knuckle? Mm -hmm. I'm, and and it's not strange. mandatory on anybody. Like I see some guys where they just tape their hand, right? But I, I think a lot of people do that for wrist support, right? Like, you know, obviously you punched like a bag with no support in your wrist and a lot of the times it folds. But didn't Joe Riggs get his eye cut because of one of the, uh, when he fought Lombard, didn't the rap actually scrape his eye? I heard that, yeah. And mm. it's, you know, I think that this is an organization that's still very brand new and they're probably still working all these kinks out. But, um, I mean, I'm probably going to tape the shit out of my wrist uh, yeah. just for that, for the reason of support. But... Yeah, I think that's something that's, you know, it's definitely a possibility of getting cut on that stuff. Do you but know when you're fighting? October 22nd. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. It's coming uh, up. October 22nd. Do you have an opponent? No opponent yet, but it's really? uh, Chandler, Arizona is what they're saying. What so, weight? 155s. Okay, so, so you're not going to have to cut. No, a that's what I told them. I said, look, dude, I... Like we had just talked about, yeah. I don't want to cut much anymore, you know. Obviously, I'm getting older. It's harder. It's going to be hard as hell to make 45s. But um, if I can go 55s, I would greatly appreciate that. And they're like, no, that's actually better. You're going to have more opponents to choose from. So uh, I think that's what we're going to do. Um, How many know, rounds? Uh, they're five. Five two-minute rounds, which I why, think why is— Why are they doing two-minute rounds? I don't know why they're maybe just— I'm not sure exactly what their thought process on that, but I, I mean, I love that. I'm an explosive athlete, obviously. I think this, I'm pretty much built for this style of fighting. You know, I can get in there, I can be fast, explosive, quick, um, powerful, and, you know, it's a quick round. I don't have to, uh, you know, pace, yourself. pace myself, grind yeah. out those five minute rounds. I can just get in there and knock someone's head off and uh and be good so that's gonna be a big difference for you right yeah. going from five minute rounds to two, two minute, minute rounds, rounds. Yeah. dude i've been hit mitts for two minute rounds and i'm like 
I feel like I just started. Right, right. Like I could go, you know, I feel good. It feels are you great. training two minutes or are you doing longer so that you feel like two minutes is nothing? We're going to mix both in. And, and my thought process on that is um, even when I was training for five minute rounds, we do five minute rounds. I don't, we would do more of them, but I want my body, my mind to get used to exactly what it's going to feel like because of that reason, like, holy shit, it's already over. Right. You know? So I need to know, like, you know, basically where I'm at in the round, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I want to get used to that, but I'm definitely going to do some longer stuff too, or we'll do, you know, like 10, two minute rounds. So you're basically just doing more of the exact same thing to where it's, you know, you hit those five and it's like, shit, I could go another, another full fight here. So how long did you have to think about this before you decided to do it? Well, like I said, it's been a, a whole year process kind of going back and forth. Uh, my wife absolutely hates it. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> you're fucking nuts. But you know, she for, married a fighter. I know, and that's what she's got to. She's got to <laughs> remember that, right? But uh, um, no, I mean, it's it's definitely something we sat down and had to had to figure out because it's you know it is something that's pretty brutal. And my my argument to her was this: like a UFC glove, maybe a quarter of an inch of leather, half inch of leather over my knuckles. I mean, it, the concussion's not going to be much different, if anything. I, I think we're obviously dealing with a sharper object hitting you, so cuts are probably going to be a lot more prevalent but as far as the concussion of you know getting hit you know I don't think it's going to be much different I also don't have to worry about a baseball bat head kick going whipping through and right. cracking me in the dome either or someone a big knee out yeah, uh-huh. yeah so you know there's a lot of other things in the MMA game that I think are a lot more dangerous but um you know for me it's just it had to make sense. Obviously, the the numbers they were throwing out in the beginning didn't make sense for me. I have, you know, other businesses that are are doing really well right now that are are something that I can do for the rest of my life and not have to ever fight. But I have that itch to get in there and compete still, and I I might as well do it now while I'm still in my prime and I have that opportunity. Because like I said, when I start hitting thirty eight, thirty nine, you know, maybe. Yeah. These opportunities have come and gone and nobody even really cares to see me fight anymore. Or, you know, I just don't feel good enough to get in there and do it. So it's interesting how they're going after so many former UFC fighters. I mean, it's smart, right? <clears throat> These people are already famous. You know, they got Paige Van Zant, Hector Lombard. Mm-hmm. Um, you now, who else is over there? I know uh, Leonard Garcia. Um, who else? Uh, uh, Rochelle. Uh, she just fought Paige. Uh, is Ostrovich? Osh- Rachel Ostrovich. Ostrovich, yeah. yes. Yeah. Did you um, already say her? Sorry. No, 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 I didn't say her. Um, I'm just trying to... Uh, so they're doing a smart thing where they're mm-hmm. getting popular fighters or who are, you know, known for UFC fights mostly and then just introducing the bare knuckle world to them yeah. and th- i know it's growing right i mean it's, it's it's people are paying attention now they're watching a lot of fights yeah i, I know uh forbes just did a write-up saying it's the fastest growing combat sport in the world right now you know and well i always thought that like it was weird that you could else elbow somebody in the face you could head kick somebody with a bear shin you can <laughs> knee him in the nose with no pads but your hands are covered yeah. with a pad <laughs> i was i was like but i used to say like why don't we just go bare knuckle? Because first of all, to make grappling more realistic, mm-hmm. like submissions, mm-hmm. you could sink in chokes and stuff much 100%. easier. But then I saw Chris Lieben versus, uh, who was it, Dakota? What's his name? Anyway, Chris Lieben's face got destroyed. Yeah, uh-huh. It was crazy, the cuts. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, maybe bare knuckle's pretty fucked. It is, and I think that's, you know, you're going to have a lot of blood, which probably makes it pretty entertaining for a lot of people but Mm -hmm. yeah cuts are definitely gonna be there i mean like you said elbows though in the ufc like oh yeah up against the cage slashed up somebody or even off off their back and you're on Mm -hmm. top dropping elbows i mean those cut probably more than knuckles i would imagine but yeah um i think you get hit a lot more with punches than you do with elbows in a fight and that's probably where more more cuts would come in but how many of these things you gonna have Man, so so here's the situation. I, I'm still under UFC contract. Really? I still have fights on my UFC contract. So, you know, there still is a possibility that I come back and maybe I want to do one or two more UFC fights after this. We'll see. I'm going to get in there 
And is I'm the gonna, UFC giving you a green light to do this? Is that how yeah, it works? Uh-huh. Interesting. So, which is super cool to use. I mean, they basically could have just said, fuck you, you're not competing anymore. Well, they kind of said, fuck you to George St. Pierre when he wanted to fight yeah. Oscar De La Hoya. Well, that's because it's Oscar. <laughs> I know, but come but on, man. That's a great payday for mm -hmm. George. I know, I know. Um, and in fact, some of that stuff was in the works for me. Like, we taught, I was, my name was thrown in there with Oscar. Really? Yeah. Uh, which would have been freaking cool just to say you get in there and box a guy like Oscar. But, yeah, they, they wanted nothing to do with any of that stuff. So, you know, yeah, for the them UFC to let and go, Oscar do not get it's Dana not, and mm -hmm, Oscar do mm -hmm, not get along. Yeah, what is the source of that? Do you know? I don't know, but I always see them talking shit to each other. It's so it, dumb. Yeah, but so dumb. Yeah, like you know why? Yeah. What is what's happening? I don't know, but luckily the payday I was talking about getting with them is what I'm getting in bare knuckle now, and you know, obviously it would have been cooler to say that I'm boxing Oscar De La Hoya, but now I remember why. Oscar De La Hoya had that MMA organization for a, a short period of time uh, where he had Tito fight Chuck. Uh, Remember that? Yep. And he was talking all kinds of shit about that, the UFC mm -hmm. and talking all kinds of shit about fighter pay. Mm -hmm. And then he's one and done and the organization falls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Understandable. That's why. But <laughs> they, they always do that, yeah. though. They always come for the UFC. Mm -hmm. When you're the UFC, it's like... That's got to be pretty uh, cool for the UFC. Everyone's always trying to be the UFC or are trying to create these MMA organizations that are trying mm -hmm. to be on the level of the UFC. Nobody's ever going to do that, you know? Yeah. And it's, I mean, I get, if somebody was talking shit to me, I would be like, fuck you too. Like if I was in Dana's position, you know, but none of these guys are ever going to touch the UFC. Or well, the only one that's close is Bellator. Yeah. And Bellator you, has some real legit talent right now. Mm -hmm. Nemkov. Um, uh, AJ McKee, yeah, he's a bad motherfucker, mm -hmm. dude. The way he took out Pitbull in that last yeah. fight, mm -hmm. dude, that guy is legit, <sighs> legit. Eighteen and zero, undefeated, world champion. You know, I mean, come on, man. Yeah. Douglas Lima, world class. Michael Venom Page, they've got, they got legit talent over mm -hmm. there. You know, mm -hmm. they really do. Gerard Musasi, yeah. No, I agree, and I, I think the talent's been like that for a while now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, a lot of these guys have been there for a bit, but. I guess my thing was it's, you know, you got so many people that are just like, the UFC is is the NFL, you yep. know, and it's, yep. you know, we'll see. I don't know if it'll ever be as big as UFC, but I just, you know, it is. It. It's 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 odd that all of them have a name, mm -hmm. you know, like none of them are just like boxing is just boxing, yeah. right? Kickboxing uh -huh. is, I guess, kickboxing is the same because you have Glory, you had K One, you had all these organizations, but. It's odd that no one just says like Showtime MMA mm -hmm. and then just has MMA on Showtime. Like yeah. you know, you know, it has yeah. to, everything has to be like a Bellator, One mm -hmm. FC. There's always like some name, the yeah. PFL. Uh -huh. There's always something. Yeah, yeah. the I, PFL. I try to follow. The fights are great, but the, your fucking score system sucks. Yeah, like I'm like, what are you saying? Yeah, he's got points. What is mm -hmm. this? He moves up the I, rankings. He's got 600 for that and 35 <laughs> I don't get for it this. Either. Like, yeah. the fuck are you doing, man? Just yeah. have fights. Yeah. Have you seen the the? There actually was bare bare knuckle MMA that just started. And I think that's was that a uh, God? Who was it? it? Was a UFC fighter that started that? I thought. Um, I just saw it was a full MMA fight though, bare knuckle, or it's gonna happen. Oh, and, um, I don't know about this at all. No, yeah, no, I, I haven't heard this. Uh, Jamie Ho Masvidal. Oh, that's right. It Is was it Masvidal. MMA? Yes. It's not boxing. No, it's oh, full MMA. I like it. I like it. Oh. I think it should be that way. I really do. <laughs> People have a hard time with it because of the, the cuts and everything like mm -hmm. that. And I, I agree with you that it's easy to cut somebody, but. Think, it's just they think it's more barbaric, but come yeah. on, man. How, but think, how think about when the UFC came out? Like everybody thought of the UFC as barbaric. Like yep. my manager was kind of going over this with me uh, the other day, and he's like, "I remember trying to get sponsors when the UFC was kind of first taken off, and a lot of these companies were just like, oh, hell no! Like we can't be associated with that, you right. know.' And now it's you know it's the UFC MMA is like so accepted. Maybe this is going to be the next." The next thing, you know, who knows? Could be, but yeah, I mean, Masvidal has a good chance of making it happen. <laughs> I've said for guy. a long time that they should have it on a, like a football field. Yeah, like no, no more cages <laughs> uh -huh. because the cage is a big factor. It's a big factor in the fight. I mean, if you can have basketball and you have it on this big ass court, how come we can't have a fight on a big it's ass true. court? Yeah, just pad the shit out of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> make it so that uh, 
there's like a an area where you can't pass, you know? And you just chase each other down and beat the shit out of each other. Yeah, don't you know, don't let anybody run away. You can't mm-hmm. just run away. You like you lose points for running away, but lateral movement's good, mm-hmm. footwork is good. Basically but, there's no walls anywhere. Yeah, so it's right. like you're just out in the open fighting. Because think about that. like takedowns. Takedowns occur so often up against the cage, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's a big part of the strategy of getting someone up against the cage is taking mm-hmm. them down. And then people use the cage to get back up onto their feet. Think about how few takedowns you'd have, how many less takedowns you'd have if you had no cage, and also how few people would get up. It's true. Get up less. Yeah. yeah. It'd be more realistic mm-hmm. because the cage is, is a factor. It yeah. is a factor. And I guess in a street fight, most of the time you don't have a wall to climb up. Right. Unless you're fighting in a mall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's, um, it's a factor. And the mm-hmm. more factors you can cut out that are extraneous, yeah. I think the better. Mm, I like it. We might have to push that They forward. did it in Russia, but they do everything in Russia. Dude, I saw like a, like a team fight. Yep. You see it where like every, I don't understand the rules, but it's like everybody's just going at yeah, it. Chaos. Yeah, chaos. Yeah. One side wears red, one side wears yeah. blue, whatever, and they just beat That's the fuck crazy. out of each other. I saw a three-on-one fight the other day. It was ridiculous. Yeah, my-, my This uh, is it. Yeah, three-on-one. Oh, on yes, this is it. But the problem is the fuck, the guy's the same size. Like, I've seen two-on-ones where the one guy was big, but these three guys that fought this one guy, look, they're what all the, the same hell? size. So this isn't even like team versus team. It's one no. dude versus three. Yeah, I, I just don't understand. How this do guy's you... seen too many Jackie Chan movies. Yeah, what they the just bum-rushed this boy. <laughs> they threw him oh. down and just started hammer-fisting him in the face. Look at this. Look how they did it. Oh, my God. Like, how, how could you expect to win? What? Uh, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> like, did that guy actually expect to go in there and say, like, oh, I'm going to beat three dudes up? The one guy just kind of held him down, and then the other guys, the other two guys hammer fisted Good him. Good job, bro. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks thank for you. hammer fisting the <laughs> fuck out of my childhood. <laughs> now I can't think about the seventh grade anymore. Oh, Look at them. They're cheering. Yes, go get more. Man. Yeah. Rush is wild. They're nuts, man. They're willing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're willing to try. Oh. Those fucking crazy people. Yeah. It's, uh... I, I'm not I'm not interested in that, but I am no. interested in removing as many factors as possible. I like that. Yeah, I do. I mean, when I first started doing commentary in '97, people didn't have gloves except Vitor and Tank, and Scott Ferrozo. Scott Ferrozo had gloves too. Mm. Most people had no gloves. Really? I didn't. Yeah. I guess I didn't know that. Yeah, when Vitor fought Trey Telegman, Trey Telegman had, was uh, no gloves. He's like a little bit of tape on his hands, and mm-hmm. that's it. So yeah. basically, we, that was the bare knuckle. That was the start of the bare knuckle. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe Scott Ferrozo didn't even have gloves back then. See if you could find a video of Scott Ferrozo versus Vitor. I'm not sure if Scott had gloves. Dude, but, that's crazy. Yeah, Vitor was one of the first guys that had gloves on, and he just did it to protect his hands. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was back when you could wear shoes too. Ah, a I lot of guys wore that, yeah. shoes. Yeah, man, I think that's my biggest fear. With doing this bare knuckles, breaking my hands. Vitor is 19. Look at oh, that. Man. Pit fighting. 19 <laughs> years old. Think yeah. Back to when Six, I was 19. He was 205, and that was his actual weight. <sighs> you know, because he didn't. Three, look, at, look how thick he was. Jeez. He was so thick. This is pre-Bruce Buffer, son. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. That was uh, someone else doing the uh, introductions. This was the first time uh, that I ever was ever uh, at a fight. I was doing the post-fight interviews, and this was uh, the one in Dothan, Alabama. <laughs> Were you just like, "What the fuck?" What the fuck? Yeah, yeah. man. I was. This was '97, and uh, I couldn't believe I was even there. I was like, <laughs> "This is so wild." It was supposed to be in New York, but then New York banned it. And then last minute, they uh, they they had a backup plan. Bob Myrowitz, who owned the UFC at the time, had a, a bat. Yeah, see, Scott's got gloves on, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he had gloves on, and Vitor had gloves on, but uh, Trey Telegman did not have so, gloves on. So they weren't mandatory. The no. guys could do it. So Trey had, or, or excuse me, Scott had already won one fight, and Vitor had won one fight. Yeah, I saw that cut up of his eye. Yeah. God, look at Vitor. He man. was so fast, Just dude. And everybody thought that it was, look, look at that straight Jeez. left, man. Oh. Boom. He was so fast, neon belly, and just bing, 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 bing. Lights out. Well, he was he had legit jujitsu. You know, he yeah. was from uh, Carlson Gracie lineage, oh. and then the fastest hands you'd ever seen inside the octagon up to that point. And that's a big dude. Oh yeah, he's fighting. Look at that. Whoa, whoa, whoa! 
he thought the fight was still going on. <laughs> yeah. And that was when Big John McCarthy was a house, too. Look so he had that. to separate yeah. people. Big John. <laughs> Look at Big John's a tank, too. Oh, yeah, he's a huge fella. And back then he was power lifting. You know? mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. But the funny thing is he would knock guys out and go, jujitsu, yeah. jujitsu. It's like, dude, you just use your hands, bro. That was boxing. Yeah. boxing. <laughs> <laughs> but when he fought Trey Telegman, Trey Telegman was bare knuckle. It was, uh, you could grab shorts back then, too. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I remember Waleed Ishmael was fighting somebody, and the dude was grabbing his shorts and giving him a full-on wedgie. Oh, yeah. Like, you could grab shorts. You could literally, like, hike them right up a dude's ass. Yeah. Like, there was a lot of crazy rules back then. Still groin, groin strikes, too, huh? Uh, yeah. yeah. Joe Son and Keith I Hackney. Remember, remember that? <laughs> Keith <laughs> Hackney just yeah. pounded him in the uh -huh. balls. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, crazy days back then, man. Mm -hmm. Crazy days. Yeah. Guys wore geese and yeah. shit, you know? Could you imagine just having a dude sit there yeah. just uppercutting your nuts the whole time? Is this uh, the Trey Telegman fight? Yeah, see, if you watch Telegman, oh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's got no gloves on. If you watch, see, oh, look man. at that. And shoes. He had yeah. shoes on. Yeah, that was from a childhood uh, car accident. Was it? Yeah, Missing he had no peck. peck. Yeah, or uh, some of his peck. That was the early days of the Lions Den. Remember mm -hmm. that? Lions oh, yeah. Den was the first. Yep. You know, like it was like Lions Den and then like Militich fighting systems yep. in the sort of the same era, but they were the first MMA teams. But the Lions Den had like these crazy initiation uh like tests that they put guys through. Really? Basically like you know, just like try to break you mentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were well documented, like incredible like physical conditioning drills and then sparring and just like try to break you. They I would like try to that. break you. Why don't we still have that today? Because they're trying to preserve athletes' futures. <laughs> 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 what do you think about guys uh, that don't spar? Like when you hear guys don't spar. I think it's weird, man. I I mean but like, I look at it. Max Holloway. Yeah. When Max Holloway fought uh, Cater, mm -hmm. how good did he look? Really good. And and, and right? Josh Emmett, my, one of my oh, teammates, yeah. his last fight, which was one of the best striking fights he's ever had, didn't he did like very very light sparring movement. How come? I I can't remember why, but my my like coach, an injury or something. It could have been, or that might just be the way that he's moving. Like he just doesn't want to spar hard anymore, which I get. <clears throat> Especially the style of fighting that he has, like he's yeah, a, he such a brawler. Like, oh my god! I got like when me and him go light sparring, both of us get our bells rung. Like both of us are just like bulls in a china shop, yeah. trying to go. Like neither one of us can go real light. It's tough. But um, no, he he said I just I didn't spar hard, and I I get it because you know obviously most of the damage that I ever took through any of my fights was through training camp really getting your bell rung multiple times or you know it, obviously that stuff adds up and it's not good i remember when we first got to team alpha male like it was like me benavidez uh um dillashaw danny castillo justin buckles like we had all all the ufc guys in there in favor and we would just 16 ounce gloves headgear tape up and just basically be trying to ko each other for the entire sparring session, you know? And I remember there was guys that would get knocked out, like, you know, guys that would jump in and spar with us and, you know, would get knocked out. I remember one of the guys went out and sat in his car, and he sat he sat in the driver's seat for, like, 20 minutes and then didn't realize, like, he looked at his clock and he didn't realize he was there for that long. Like, he was basically concussed, like, really Just bad. out of it. Yeah, yeah. It was just, like, sitting there. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's not good, man. And so we didn't know that. I mean, Dwayne's actually the one that kind of calmed us down when he came into Team Alpha Mel. Like, what the hell are you guys doing? Yeah. Let's yeah. get some structure to this, you know, right. and had drills and, you know, calmed us down, even in striking. Like, let's go 30%. Let's go 50%, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you still get some asshole that's in there just like, ah. But, right. You know, he, he definitely kind of opened our eyes to the – the preserving preserving of the brain type sparring, you know, and and uh, it definitely helped. I think once we started doing that, everybody's technique got so much better. Well, Dwayne is a master of technique. I yeah. mean, he is one of those guys that emphasizes technique. The ten technique is everything. What's so interesting to me about Dwayne's style of teaching is it's so much different than his style of fighting. It's like he realized something when he was done fighting, like, you know what? 
I kind of know how to do this better. Yeah. And <laughs> like the switching of stances and all the feints and the fakes. Uh-huh. But if you go back and watch his Muay Thai career or Dwayne's MMA career, I mean, amazing fights, but mm. he doesn't fight like TJ. No. Not no. at all. Like he, but he taught TJ a better way to fight. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. Like I remember him when he was at Team Alpha Male. I think that was kind of the beginning of doing all that type of stuff. And I don't know if he was just kind of like testing all this stuff out on us and then in like see what would take and then be like, oh, that works. Right. And then keep going that direction. And then if you try something that doesn't, then just kind of throw it away. But dude, I remember, I mean, obviously, you know, Dwayne, but caffeine, notepad, and that guy would just sit there. I don't think that guy sleeps. I mean, he'll sit there all night probably writing combos. and He's and, obsessed. Oh, yeah. He's I, obsessed. I love that, man. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that about a coach that mm-hmm. can go and do that. You know, it's you have those very few coaches in your life that have that obsession, and you know that's something special. Mm-hmm. And Dwayne has that. Yeah, Mark Henry is another one of those guys. Um, uh, in jujitsu, Donaher. Donaher is another mm-hmm. one of those guys. There's a few of those guys that have that absolute obsession mm-hmm. with watching guys improve mm-hmm. and and figuring out what's the best technique and and also like Mark Henry's amazing because he develops combinations specific to each individual fighter and then names them yeah. based on like their kids or their friends cool. or where they grew up or you know mm-hmm. for you it'd probably be like uh, the the archery elk hunt yeah. or something <laughs> he would yell, yell out some weird thing where nobody else would understand what the uh-huh. fuck you were saying and you would know what to do mm-hmm. and that and he would change it with every camp that's cool yeah, yeah that's, that's super wild cool. yeah in the wrestling world Sammy Henson was that guy for me uh, my senior year was I mean Sammy took me to that next level you know and he was one of those guys that was obsessed and he would like pull me aside we'd have like separate one-on-one type sessions and um, and it, it really does make all the difference in the world it really does mm-hmm. yeah if you can find someone who's that obsessed as a coach I mean uh, I talked to Gordon Ryan about it when it comes to John Donaher and he's like there's no mistake like the reason why I'm so good is not just because of his Obviously, he's physically gifted. He's intelligent. He's super disciplined super dedicated But also he said John Donaher is like a cheat code. He's like I have this crazy Obsessed jujitsu coach who coaches seven days a week 365 days a year doesn't take any days off ever Mm -hmm. has no family has no girlfriend and then when he's done coaching watches fights. Yeah That's special Try finding one of those guys. That's that's fucking special also a genius Mm -hmm. who was a Professor at Columbia yeah. taught philosophy. <laughs> what? Yeah. Try finding one of those guys. Good luck. Yeah. They don't happening. exist. There's one. Yeah. You know, and you know, and he's actually moving here. Is he? Which is very exciting. Oh yeah. no way. Yeah, he's moving to Austin. Oh, you're, you're yeah. going to be all over. That oh man, I can't yeah. wait. Can't That's wait to pick cool. his brain. Yeah. I mean, look at just just even for my commentary game, I, I would for sure want to learn jujitsu from him. But just my commentary game will improve in leaps and bounds just talking to him. That's cool. He's amazing. But, you know, how many of those guys exist? There's a few of those guys in, you know, in kickboxing, of course. You got Dwayne. You know, you got Trevor Whitman. Trevor Whitman is a spectacular coach. You know, mm-hmm. he's got, you got some amazing coaches out there, mm-hmm. without a doubt. But to find ones that are just maniacally obsessed, mm-hmm. it's so rare. And it's, man, I do, I miss, I miss training with Dwayne. Like, I, that whole situation with Faber, obviously. Very, uh, you know, very upsetting. Yeah, it, it is, man. And I, I stayed out of the middle of it, you know, I have a ton of respect for Faber and I have a ton of respect for Dwayne. As do I. Yeah. So, you yeah, know, I love both of those guys. It mm-hmm. sucked. And you know, I talked to Dwayne about it and I talked to Faber about it. I'm like, ah, I know. You know I, I can't do anything. I don't know them well enough mm-hmm. to get in the middle of it and arbitrate, but I feel like the the improvement that everybody was making under Dwayne was tangible. Mm-hmm. It was noticeable. Yeah. It's like he came along and then all of a sudden all of a sudden, everybody had this footwork, they're moving good, mm-hmm. their striking combinations seem to be improving. I agree. Yeah. TJ for sure was the most he benefited the he, most he from took it. to it probably the best for yeah, sure like a yep. duck to water yeah yeah it, it worked perfect for TJ his style of wrestling his body style and his ability to I mean TJ is one of those guys that gets obsessed too mm-hmm. and him and Dwayne just really meshed on that on that fact of notepad writing you know mapping everything out and TJ has that memory you know, that kind of comes along with it where he can remember all these different crazy combos and then get out there and actually perform it. Like that takes a special athlete to be able to 
see that thing on paper, train it, and then actually hit it in a fight for the sure. The wild thing about his fight with Sanhagen was Sanhagen had him in a fucking triangle, mm -hmm. locked up. And I was like, man, I wonder if he had some like pointers on how to finish that better. That would have been it. Because it yeah. seemed locked the fuck in. I mean, mm -hmm. he went to, through a he threw a knee, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, TJ takes him down, and in the process of taking him down, he locks okay. up, mm -hmm. fully locked up triangle early in the fight. And I was like, man, I feel like he's got this. Mm -hmm. I was like, I thought TJ was going to tap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I mean, that dude's a beast. I, I was worried for TJ going into that fight. I mean, that's a lot of people are like, oh, I think TJ's going to go in there and just destroy. And I'm like, ugh, like I... You know, you I love destroy TJ, San Hagen. I no, mean, the, the only guy who's ever really destroyed him was um, was Aljo, and Aljo took him down and choked him. Yeah. You know, and aljamain has got some fucking nasty jujitsu. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. I mean, no, I, I definitely knew this was going to be a tough fight, and it was a tough fight coming off of that long. You know, mm -hmm. and like TJ's not getting a tune-up fight. Like this is going to make or break. Like show everyone TJ's back, or TJ's going to have to fight a couple times and get back. But it's close to a decision as you're ever going to see. Too. Yeah, I mean, like you could you can ma make an argument that mm -hmm. that Sanhagen did more damage, and you can make an argument that uh, Dillashaw controlled him more. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a damage guy. I lean towards damage always. Yeah, but, but TJ close was ass fucking up, fight. Man. It was close ass fight. Mm -hmm. Well, I. I guarantee they're going to run it back. Oh, they <laughs> have gonna to. We're going to see that at least one more time. Yeah. So, well, unfortunately, with TJ surgery, I mean, he has like several major yeah. tears in mm -hmm. that knee. You really never know what a guy's like mm -hmm. once you get your knee mangled like mm -hmm. that because the pain, like, it might inhibit training. It might become a problem. You know, it's ho so hard to say. Yeah. On TJ's post, he said it happened at this part right here. Where his knee gets all twisted. Yeah, up. Yep. heel hook right yep. there. That's so the that heel hook. Yeah. yeah. So he was r r yanking on that heel hook. Yeah. You could see it. I mean, go go back. And by the way, that is the worst kind of heel hook. The inside yeah. heel hook right oh, there. Oh man, that's so nasty. So TJ just didn't tap, and he just tore his his shit apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see it there. See him keeping. Knee, yeah. yeah, he's keeping his weight off it there for a second. You yeah. can see yeah. that here. He falls too in the second round. It's just, well, I'm sure because his knee was fucking mangled already. Mm -hmm. Look at him stepping on it funny. Yeah, yeah he's walking I guess odd. I didn't notice that before, but. Yeah, he he played it off well. He yeah. really did a good job playing it off and, and gutting it out because he was obviously <laughs> in like some serious pain. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, right, right there, there yeah, he got clipped. Yeah. But part of getting dropped there was because he had no balance on yeah. that left leg. Mm -hmm. It was very wobbly. Well, you know, have you had any surgeries on your knees? No, thankfully, I've really? torn both uh, MCLs um, through wrestling, but it's it, they were partial tears, and it was basically through wrestling season. I just had to wear a brace and do a lot of swimming, and it was actually uh, I think it was the first year as an All American. I tore it like a couple weeks or a few weeks before Pac Tens, and uh, just swam every workout up to pack 10s and then I just taped it up went in there and I ended up winning pack 10s wow and then uh, ended up getting sixth um, did you ever get surgery on it after no that? they just it was one of those things you just got to let heal up mm -hmm. they said unless it's a complete tear um, you just basically let it heal hey one thing I wanted to talk to you about is you got on the carnivore diet and yeah. it really cured up your psoriasis yeah, yeah. is that I mean how long have you had psoriasis for my whole life. I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, I, it started on my shins um, and it was just a small little patch. And I think as a kid, I even thought it was just a ringworm from wrestling, you know, mm -hmm. but um, it just never went away. And then just over the years kind of slowly spread, got bigger. So it's basically from knee to ankle on both shins. And then, you know, as I started getting older, it's starting to sh it started showing up in different spots. I got on my elbows, my scalp ears uh little patches on my on my body cavity and what was your diet like then um just i mean I, i'd like to say pretty much i eat clean you know I, but i mean everyone you know i'd still every once in a while eat some like fast food or you know if i go to somebody's house and there's they're making stuff i eat whatever they eat but um you know for the most part i thought i was pretty clean until I got on this diet and then I really figure out like how bad 
I was eating. Like the amount of sugar, I think, is key. Like I got on this diet and I did it. I started March. I started March one, and I did it for the last four months, um, or four months into that. Um, but basically, sugar I noticed was probably the worst thing for it. Um, did you notice this because you added it in occasionally and you would see a difference? No, I just was. You know, I it's my my psoriasis over the years has just gotten worse and worse and worse until. Mm -hmm. Uh, my buddy was basically telling me about this diet and um, we started a, basically the American almond beef, my, my beef company. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I have, <laughs> I have all the beef at my fingertips here. I have all this wild game that I can live off of. The meat part of it's not going to be an issue. It's basically me just making my mind up and being like, just this is this. all I eat. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. And so it's always been something when I was fighting, like, ah, just because I've, I've known about it. People have told me about it. Like, I think it'll really help your psoriasis. You should try it. But I'm like, I can't, I can't uh, cut out carbs. Like, I need carbs for training. Like, I'm, I'm an explosive athlete. So that was always my mindset, you know? So right. I never did it. And then finally, I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it for a month. And if I don't see any improvements, I'll just kind of go back to normal. If I do see improvements, I'm going to continue doing it maybe for like two or three months and see what it looks like, basically check back in and go from there. Dude, within like a week, my psoriasis was already night and day like for, on my leg. And I that was the before and after picture. I think it was maybe a week or even two weeks. On your Instagram, you posted yeah, uh -huh. it. Yeah. And it was just like my psoriasis was – that was right after a, a hunt that I had gone on. and the lack of sleep really flares it up, which I obviously on hunts, I'm eating bad in camp, whatever, whatever we're making. Um, you know, I'm getting like four hours of sleep at night and I'm usually living off of a lot of caffeine. Those three things definitely flare it up pretty bad. Um, and so that first picture was like extreme. And then the, the next, the picture next to it was on that diet for, I think it was a week. Maybe it could have been two weeks. I'll have to look back and see, but dude, it was already so much better. I'm like, well, shit, I'm going to keep doing this and just see. So I kept, kept doing it. And, uh, you know, I don't know. It was probably three months in. I'm just like, it's like almost gone. Um, and ideally I think it would be completely gone if I cut out caffeine, which you know, they talk about you probably won't need caffeine after a couple months. Your energy levels will be better, which they were. I just really fucking enjoy getting all cracked out and getting a bunch of shit done. <laughs> <laughs> so I do love coffee. Yeah. It's me, a problem. Uh, it's so good. Yeah. But, um, and then alcohol, you know, I just, I'm not probably ever going to just quit alcohol. I, every once in a while, I like to go have some wine with some buddies or right. go have some drinks. I'm a tequila guy. I'll sip some tequila. But, um, uh, as long as you're doing it in motivate in moderation, rather, it seems to yeah uh -huh. be okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I've just kind of been sticking to it. I talked to uh, Sean and Paul. I've talked to both of those guys, and uh, it basically, Doc, you're talking about Doctor Sean Baker, yes, Sean Baker, and Paul Saladino. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yep, yeah, both those guys. both those guys are doctors, and they're also proponents of the carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, the idea was do this for three months and then start adding things back in mm -hmm. and just figure out what foods flare it up. Well, Paul is a proponent of uh, honey and some fruits, mm -hmm. you know, and I think when, when I'm doing it, I, I do it on and off. And when I'm doing it, I always have fruit before I exercise. Yep. That's what I like to do. I just eat like apples or something mm -hmm. before I exercise and I, cause I need the fast sugar and I know I'm going to burn it off anyway. Yeah. But I really do feel better when I'm just eating just mostly meat. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind salads. Salads are good. Mm -hmm. Salads don't seem to have a, an effect on me. But man, the thing that has an effect on me is pasta and dessert. Yeah. Those are mm -hmm. the big ones. They, they sure. have a they have a big, I feel like shit when I eat a lot of pasta. Yep. And I'm a fucking glutton. <laughs> and I just I keep doing it. I keep them so dumb. Yeah. I'm so dumb. I know I always feel terrible. But while I'm eating it, it feels so good. Yeah. So good, man. It's, yeah. yeah, I'm the same. And I've, I've been doing fruits uh, pretty much... Uh, most vegetables, like your nightshades, mm -hmm. like tomatoes and pepper, I notice will start getting it flared up a bit. Really, potatoes. I've started putting a little bit of potatoes back in. Yeah, here and there, and it doesn't seem too bad uh, yet. Um, what I think about I sweet potatoes? Is that sweet, a sweet potatoes are okay. Yeah. Um, 
but mainly just fruits, vegetables. I, I've been doing honey, um, even even mixing in some whole oats here and there. Um, Paul was like against that. He's like, I probably wouldn't do that, but I just wanted to see, and it doesn't seem to be flaring it up too bad. So what I do notice is sugars though. Like if I have any just processed sugars, you know, you're anything like your processed breads. I haven't been doing any wheat, like any breads pretty much at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have a little bit of white rice here and there and that seems to be fine. So, but for the most part, it's mostly meat diet. Yeah. Now when you're training, have you adjusted it at all during training? Mm -hmm. I had to do that. And I, I did notice, not that I felt bad, I just felt, I feel better. And I'm guessing it's because I'm more of an explosive athlete maybe, but right. I feel better when I have more carbohydrates in there. So, you know, obviously lots of fruits, you know, for your sugars, but that's where I started uh, implementing a little bit of the whole oats and the white rice too, as a white rice is like a post-workout. Um, but ma- mainly for me, the diet is for my psoriasis. So, you know, if I can eat that stuff and it doesn't flare it up, I'm going to do it because it doesn't make me feel bad. What about you know? just something bland, like plain rice? Does that fuck with you at all? No, not at all. And that's, So maybe that's a good option for carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of, uh, like I talked to Robert Oberst. I had him on the podcast. Yeah. You know who he is? No, no. One of the world's strongest men, like uh, okay. literal yeah. giant. Yeah. Like, his okay. head is as big as both of us together. <laughs> he's huge. He has, uh, he's, he's a funny dude too. Yeah. Really hilarious. But- um, mostly what he's eating is meat and rice, Yeah, you know, and he's like, it's just easy to digest. It's simple, you know, so a lot of folks have uh, a problem with bread, mm-hmm. like bread and pastas. And it's just for a lot of people, that seems to be a thing that it's fucks so them. Good. Yeah. But rice, I would think is a pretty easy, especially white rice, mm-hmm. pretty easy thing to digest. Yep. And I, and so far I haven't had any issues. Like it's, I, I eat it and I'm like waiting for my psoriasis to just start itching, you know, mm-hmm. and it doesn't. So I've also heard people say that like things you eat can, it's like a delayed effect, you know, th- up to 30 days or something like that for your psoriasis to like really get affected by it. So I don't. How does that work? I don't know. And I don't who know these what people? to believe. I don't know. <laughs> That's the thing. I, don't, I read so many different things. Right. I'm like, I don't know who to believe. So I'm just basically testing shit out on my own. Mm-hmm. And Right now, it seems that that stuff's fine. So that's what an elimination um, diet is all about, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you just get it down to a very simple, simple, simple diet, and then yeah. add back mushrooms, yeah. add back, you mm-hmm. know, fruits. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, it's it's interesting, but the reality of human bodies is that everybody's body is different, mm-hmm. and some people can thrive off nuts and berries and vegetables, and and that's like the best diet for them. And you got to find out what's the best diet for you. It's, I agree. It really is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people always ask me like, "Hey, what what's your? Can you send me your diet?" And I'm like, "It's uh, bottom line what you just said. Yeah. Everybody's different, man. Yeah, like yeah. what works for me isn't necessarily going to work for you. Yeah, you got to figure that stuff out. But I can give you kind of a guideline, mm-hmm. you know. But that is, tr- it's it's really the case. It's everybody has a, a different body, and everybody's mm-hmm. body responds differently to foods. Yeah. And obviously allergies and things too. There's a lot of people yeah. that have allergies. They don't they don't even they're not even aware of. Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, who was it? Was it Jessica? I believe just found out, um, that she was allergic to eggs and, uh, it was like one of the main focuses of her diet. Like she was eating eggs constantly and she was fucking allergic to it. Oh no. What, so what, what would it like cause or did well, she feel it bad? just makes people feel like shit. It's just uh, your body doesn't like it. It mm-hmm. just it makes you sluggish. You know, you're having a hard time digesting things. You know, I eat the shit out of eggs. Man. I love eggs. I should probably go do another one of those like uh, food allergy tests. Mm-hmm. I did one years ago, and at the time, I think like amaranth and what is that? I can find out. <laughs> what is amaranth? I don't know. That's just so what, that's you're allergic to it's it. A, yeah, that was probably it seems easy to avoid, right? <laughs> What the fuck is it? Uh, amaranth. What is amaranth, Jamie? I think it's a grain, maybe, or yeah? it is a grain. Yeah. What kind of grain? Like, I don't know. I've seen it very rarely on like, like. Whoa! Breads. Look at that thing. Meet this grain, amaranth. Yeah. 
Okay, it's uh, it's really a seed, like quinoa. Uh, yeah. Tiny seeds about the size of... I could avoid the fuck yeah, out of that. You're right. It was super easy to avoid. <laughs> you can keep but. that shit, whatever that is. I have a hard time avoiding fruits. I love fruit, uh, man. I love like a, a nice fresh orange oh, or man. apples mm-hmm. or something like that. I, I really enjoy that. I did the full carnivore diet one month, and I felt fantastic, and that was nothing but meat. Yep. All the, It was ribeye rib mm-hmm. steaks. Uh, elk mm. meat and bacon. Yep, so, I did the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and eggs, eggs too. Yeah, yeah. and eggs. eggs. Yeah. What is what is they say? It's uh, so basically it's um, met. What was it? Meds, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood. Right. Mm, yeah. Meds yeah. It's kind of what what they say is okay for that. But yeah, I did it all of March and all of April, just the full. Because I, I basically, you're one of the people that kind of made me like lit the fire under my ass like let's just do this for this rice i want to see because i saw your results Mm -hmm. and uh i was like fuck i'm gonna try it but it's just hard because i like food so much that's the only thing that's hard i mean i really do love going out to eat Mm -hmm. and i really fucking love pasta Mm -hmm. but other than that man I'm, i'm telling you i felt better i felt like i had an extra gear but it did slow me down with, uh, like, when I was doing rounds on the bag, yep. I would notice that, like, I was kind of gassing a little quicker. That, that's what I felt, too. And I, f- I felt my overall well-being felt good. Yeah. I felt like when we're here doing this, I feel energetic. I feel great. But that's that's why I started implementing a little bit more carbohydrates because same thing. Like, I was hitting mitts, and it's not that I felt bad, but I did feel like my, yeah, my explosive cardio almost yeah. would like kind of dwindle a bit. Mm-hmm. And then when I started adding in a little bit of the white rice and the grains and more fruit, man, I- f- Came right back. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I, do you know who Zach Bitter is? Mm-mm. Zach Bitter holds the world record for um, running 100 miles. He ran 100 miles in I think it was 11 hours and 40 minutes. Holy shit. He's a fucking savage. And all he eats is meat. Yeah. His whole thing is, but when he goes to do a run, he'll, he'll take like glucose gels mm. and he, he ramps up his uh, glucose for, uh, and his carbohydrates for performance. Gotcha. But he's a big proponent of a uh, carnivore diet, which is really interesting. That's- Cause you know you think like carnivore, you think like big fucking like like Sean Baker's a gorilla, yeah, yeah. Giant, giant fucking dude. But that is not Zach. Zach is you know he looks like a marathon runner. Mm. I mean he's a he's an ultra runner, and mostly eats meat. Yeah, that's he actually crazy. does a podcast with uh, Sean Baker. Really? Yeah. I'm gonna have to look that up because it, yeah, that stuff interests me. Those long endurance athletes, you know, I, and that being an explosive athlete and then someone that's basically relying on, I guess those guys do rely a lot on fat and mm-hmm. that's kind of what the carnivore diet, your your main source of energy should be fat now. Yeah. And you're basically making the switch from glycogen, from the carbohydrates to fat. And the first couple of weeks of that, I felt like shit. They, call, they I think they call it like the keto flu or something mm-hmm. like that where you're just like, I have like my brain's foggy. I'm just like yeah. tired. I don't have any motivation, no energy. Mm-hmm. And then when you, when your body kind of makes that transition, you feel. I felt so much better. I think you can move that along quicker with uh, exogenous ketones. Yeah, yeah. You take ketones. There's a bunch of ketone supplements yeah. and different See, things you could take. I should have done that. Ramp but... up your ketones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've done the keto diet too, but I just get bored. Yeah, you know. Diets suck. <laughs> I hate them. <laughs> yeah, it is. But listen, you know, I had this uh, woman on yesterday uh, who escaped from North Korea and is one of the most difficult podcasts I've ever done. It was really intense. And uh, it was listening to her talk about starving most of her life yeah. until she escaped, you know. Us sitting here talking about know, diet we're, sucking. We're assholes. <laughs> it's just, it's just such a privilege to mm-hmm. th- like. Oh, I like eating everything. Yeah. Why do I have to only eat meat? If she could only eat meat, you know how happy she would have been. Mm-hmm. She would, she would have dreams about just eating piles of eggs. You know, really <laughs> crazy, crazy story. Yeah, man. I yeah, we're assholes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just you know, you know what you know. You yeah. Know? That's crazy. I'm going to have to listen. Oh, my God. It was hard to listen oh, to. Oh, I it bet. Was, it was, uh, you know, having this conversation with her and trying to imagine that there's a place right now on the other side of the world where people are living under the thumb of a brutal dictator and, you know, they're starving to mm-hmm. death, literally. Like, most of the men are four foot ten, 
because they're just they have no nutrition mm-hmm. they're starving and she's so tiny i mean she's like literally one of the most frail women i've really? ever met in my life because she was starving her whole life mm-hmm. like when you shake her hand it's like you, you feel like they're her her like bones cracking like she's made out of glass you really? know like she's so small she's 80 pounds that's crazy yeah and she's eating whatever she wants mm-hmm. now but this is just Body's because of her life mm-hmm. you know starving all of her life it's cr- it's the one of the craziest podcasts i've ever I'm done listen to it yeah heavy man just yeah. really fucking heavy like they survived off like bugs like really? that was mostly what they ate grasshoppers is where they got their protein no from. Way. yeah and i would imagine like hunting i mean they probably don't have the energy to do much of anything honestly huh well, she was saying that little kids would catch rats that were eating dead bodies and they would eat the rats oh man they were just so starving that when they caught a rat they would, they would cook it and eat it and then they'd get sick and die uh. and then rats would wind up eating them uh. it was horrific man and this is that's happening right now that's crazy. in North Korea. Yeah, that's crazy. It's beyond fucked. Yeah, I feel horrible for talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like hey, I gotta like, fucking yeah. only eat ribeyes. Oh, this rib-eyes. sucks. Yeah. Do you uh, do you eat any organs? I do, and yeah. I, and uh, basically, I keep all the livers from all the animals I kill. Um, what about heart and heart too? I yeah. I really enjoy heart liver. It's not necessarily my favorite. I eat it because I know it's good for me. Liver and onions is good. Yeah, and I, like I haven't it. tried that for a long time, and I probably should do that. I wonder if onions saying, would fuck with your diet, though. I don't know. I mean, you know, only one way to find out, right? You know, yeah. I would sauteed onions are so delicious, man. Some grass-fed butter. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> yeah, I eat the liver as well. I'm a I'm a mm. big fan of uh, elk liver. You know, I was reading about um, these uh, Comanches that would take. I, w- I want to do this one day. They would uh, hunt buffalo, and when they would kill a buffalo, they would cut the liver out and then eat it raw and squirt bile on it oh from the gallbladder they would take really? the gallbladder and squirt bile on the raw liver and that's how they would eat it they would season it with gallbladder what do you know what the meaning or wh- why they salty would i guess i guess the uh, gallbladder salty the, huh. the bile from the gallbladder salty i mean that has got to be a fucking strong oh, flavor shit i would I imagine feel like i need to like do that super tangy just like i feel like i should have a doctor on yeah. standby <laughs> But if I ever hunt a buffalo, I'm going to do that. No, yeah. yeah. Damn it. I ended up getting one, uh, was that two years ago now? I wish oh, yeah? I would have known that. I would have tried it. But Did you really? Where yeah. at? Yeah. Well, uh, northern, uh, central California, actually. There was a, a mountain range out there that it's a 30,000 acre piece of property that this guy basically introduced a bull and like four cows to 30 years ago and just put them in there for it. Basically, he wanted his family to be able to hunt them eventually. Hmm. And over the 30 years, they've kind of just reproduced and- They've separated into a bunch of different herds, and all the surrounding pro- like ranches, the bi- the bison are starting to go in there and compete with cattle and their food and everything. So these guys are getting pissed. Mm. So that year was the first year that they basically opened it up to hunting. Like we need to take a certain amount of bulls and cows off of this property because they're starting to expand off our thirty thousand acres. And so I ended up going out there and. Smacked them with my bow and had a bunch of buddies there with me. We all broke it down and basically There's lived out that. Not a lot of like genetic diversity. I know, right? If you have one bull and four cows, mm-hmm. like maybe it was a couple bulls. I know, and there mm. was a small group that mm. he just put in there and just let go. Yeah, but they had a hunt in Yellowstone this year. This I, is like one of the first years because they, they have that. so many bulls in mm-hmm. Yellowstone that they had to hunt. But what was interesting is like the requirements. Like one of the requirements is no ATVs, mm-hmm. no horseback. I saw that email. It was like a full mm-hmm. like list of of requirements. Like it so, was, bro, you gotta get a bunch of studs to help you carry out quarters. Yeah. Like, what if you shoot one fifteen miles in? Dude, that's a. I mean, ooh, yeah, that's may- a big fucking animal, <laughs> son. <laughs> Yeah, dude. I, the bat. There's a picture of me holding one of the back straps. It's, I mean, it's taller than me. Yeah, they're huge. Oh, it's giant. Such a massive, massive animal. I I've never hunted one, mm-hmm. but I did take my kids to Yellowstone, and we were uh, in this one area where you could take photographs of them, and we're we're behind this like area where they if they wanted to they could just fucking run you over. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I think my daughters were eight. And six at the time, or nine, maybe, 
maybe nine and seven at the time. So I was like yeah, fucking dude. super helicopter dad. Uh-huh. Like the moment these motherfuckers flinch, <laughs> okay. I'm grabbing these kids like two yeah. footballs and yeah. making a run for uh-huh. the truck. Because uh, I know they, they smash people every year. Oh, yeah, year. you see videos of the kid just getting tossed. I, I know, that was, was like a little, little kid. Just like, yeah, little, she, little fucking kid. She mm-hmm. landed on her feet, luckily. Yeah. And she was okay, but... Uh, people don't realize, like, those those things are dangerous, man. They're I mean, fucking they look, dangerous. They look like they're slow and just kind of mm-hmm. lethargic, but... They run 30 quick. miles an hour. Oh, yeah. They're and they'll quick. knock your fucking car into oblivion <laughs> yeah. with their uh-huh. head. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man, it's crazy. It it's happens every year out there. Insane, insanely powerful animal and mm-hmm. so fucking delicious. Oh, yeah. You know, it's so rich in protein. so good for you, too. Mm-hmm. Moose, too. Yeah. You, you've gotten a moose, Yeah, huh? I got one moose once. Yeah. yeah. I drew a Alaska BC. tag um, a few years back and went with my buddy Pat up there. And uh, we, we were like 150 miles upriver on his little skiff boat. Wow. And ended up killing like a 63-inch just giant. Oh, my God. Me and him. It took us like over 10 hours to get this thing all cut up. 63. For folks who don't understand what that means, it's the size of the antlers where they take mm-hmm. a tape and they measure it. And 63 inches is fucking it's huge. huge. Like I could lay in it. That's like this like table. Yeah. That's like the antlers of the it size was, of this table. It was crazy. And the, the funny thing is, so he's an Alaskan resident, and he's the one that told me to put in for the tag. And he's like, you'll probably take, you know, maybe draw it in like 10 years. Boom, first year, drew it. I was just oh, like, wow. Oh. That's crazy luck. And, oh, it's so lucky. And uh, me and him went up here, but he, it was, um, they considered a trophy tag. So it has to be at least 50 inches wide, mm-hmm. or the bull has to have at least four on it, four points brow on its front size. brow time. Okay. And so he's never trophy hunted, you know, they live off, they kill the first yearling that they see and that's what they live off for the year, you know? Right. And so we come around the corner and this bull just stands up and it's huge, you know, and both of us are just standing there looking at it 50 yards. And uh, I'm like, dude, do you think that's 50 inches? Like I've, I've never <laughs> seen like a bull right. moose this close. And uh, he's like, ah, man, I think so. <laughs> but uh it could be like 49 i don't know and so we're just sitting there for like it seemed like 10 minutes just trying to like decide and it only had three and two on the front brow time so that's out so it's got to be at least 50 inches and if you i mean if you're a half an inch off like you're fucked you're fucked yeah They'll fishing game's your taking it. You. you're getting yeah. fined you're losing yep. your hunting license yep. and so we're just sitting there for a while and he's just staring at us and then finally he turns and you get that back view and we're both just like, dude, that's got to be over 50. And so I ended up getting them, and we walked over there in 63 inches. Was this it a was, bow hunt or a rifle hunt? It was a rifle hunt. Yeah. I definitely yeah. could have gotten with a bow. We were like 50 yards from him, just wow. standing there. But, it's a big fucking animal. Dude, it's so huge. And then the grizzly came into camp <gasps> that night and uh, mangled a bunch of the meat that was hanging up. Oh, Jesus. The big chunk of neck. Did you hear it? Like, no, no. That's the scary thing. We're sleeping on the boat. It's got like a little cab built on it with like two cots. And, um, Did you put the meat in a tree? Well, we had like a hang station. The fucking, you see how big those legs are, dude. It would mm-hmm. like take everything for us to get that leg that high off the ground, you know. And we're trying to like tie it up there, but it, you know everything's pretty low. And uh, the chunk of neck was probably this big around, and it grabbed that, picked it up, didn't even drag it, carried it into the woods about forty yards, and set it down and dug a big hole, took a big shit next to it. And then I don't know if we woke up and it hurt us and it took off because it never buried it, never got it in the hole. But we woke up and like a bunch of the meat was kind of mangled, like some of the the hindquarters and stuff. And we're like, dude, screw this. Let's get out of here. So we just loaded everything up. And Do you listen to the Mediator podcast? Yeah. I did that with Rinella, dude. Those guys are awesome. Did Oh, you did yeah. uh, Meat Eater? Yeah. Did you do the podcast or did you hunt with them? Uh, the podcast. I want to oh. hunt with those guys. We I've hunted with them a few times. He's awesome. Oh, yeah. I've but watched it. They had an incredible uh, episode of the podcast. We were talking about an elk hunt they had on a Fognac Island. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know that story mm-hmm. where oh, yeah. they got attacked by a bear? Yep. Like where one of the guys, Dirtmouth, actually was on the bear's back as it was Dude, running down the hill. It's fucking crazy. Like he found himself because the bear comes piling through Ugh. these guys and all of a sudden he's on this bear's back riding it down the hill. And they're, they're talking about a coastal Alaskan brown Giant, bear, yeah. which is huge. Like 11 feet tall. Mm-hmm. Dude, no way. So grizzlies, mountain lions, and sharks. Fuck that. They can all go fuck themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all I'm of them. Terrified. Those are probably my biggest fears in life. Have like, you seen a mountain lion in the wild? Uh, yeah, yeah. I had I had one stalking on me in Utah. Really? Archery hunting bulls. Yeah, I was sitting there. I was uh, filming for a hunting show, and we're, we there's a tree line right in front of us, and it's a big sage flat, 
And uh, basically the bulls would come out of the tree line and they'd cross that sage flat. And so we were going to try to cut them off, you know, and, and get in position. And we're sitting there and my camera guy's like, dude, what the hell is that? And we all turn around and there was a mama and four younger ones just, I don't know, 100 yards behind us. Oh, God. And as soon as they saw us look, they like hunk, hunkered down. Like they were, they were coming in on us. And, and as soon as we looked, obviously they like turned around and like snuck back down and there was a big canyon. They went back down into it. But dude, if we wouldn't have seen, they probably would have came right up on us. When we were elk hunting two years ago, Dudley had one 20 yards away from him. They were both stalking the same elk. No. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. You know, Dudley is a fucking ninja, right? Mm. So he's like super slow, moving quiet. And he looks over and 20 yards away from him is a fucking mountain lion. It's like, They're what just like... the hell? But, um... You know, in Texas, crazy. you just shoot them. Mm -hmm. Like in Texas, they have they are not protected at all. It's just like oh, a I coyote. Yeah. yeah, they're like get rid of it. Yeah. But in in California, you can't do anything no, to them. You can't even go out of state legally hunt one and bring it back. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but in uh, Utah, you can hunt them. You can hunt them, but you have to have a tag, tag. and it's very difficult to get. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not easy. No. Yeah, I uh, had a buddy, my buddy Adam Greentree, gave me some uh, mountain lion meat. I hear it's pretty good. I haven't eaten it yet. It's oh, you frozen. haven't? Yeah. Is it like some of the backstrap? Yeah. I I've heard I've multiple heard it's very people. good. Yeah. It's yeah. a real light meat. almost looks like pork. Ranella says it's superb. Really? That was his, his description of it. He said hmm. it, it is superb. Yeah. I'm like, really? He goes, amazing. See, I've, I always have this weird thing about eating- Predators? Predators. Things that eat meat. Yeah. Like meat, I don't know. It's just- and. I, if you think about what they're eating, like they're not like a coyote where they're just like eating stuff that's been dead for weeks and it's rotting. You know, they basically kill and they eat it fresh. And then once I'm, I could be completely wrong on this, but this is what I've been told. My buddy's a, a biologist and, you know, but basically as soon as it starts like rotting, they basically don't touch it much anymore. Mount they lions. go kill another. Yeah, yeah, probably. And so they're, they're eating the clean, fresh stuff, but still the, just the thought of eating something that's eating meat has always been a little strange. To have me. you had bear? I have. Yep. Did it I, weird you out? Uh, I mean, it was a year. <laughs> it was years ago. And I made a lot of chili and jerky out of it, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's it, it bears definitely on that list for sure. What's crazy is it was one of the preferred foods of the the mm -hmm. pioneers, mm -hmm. the people that were traveling across the country. They loved it. Yeah, because it's fatty and it was soft. Mm -hmm. You know, like one of the things about. I guess if you're just cooking things straight over fire, you would think when you think about bears, you would think for people listening to this that a bear would be like a really dense, really powerful animal like like a moose or a elk or something like that, but they're not. They're mm -hmm. soft. Mm -hmm. They're soft bodied, which is mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. Like almost like gooey. Yeah. And they have a lot of fat. Very fat, high yeah. fat content. And it's a delicious animal, yeah. and they ate the shit out of them mm -hmm. when they were traveling across the the country, mm -hmm. and in, including uh, a lot of Native Americans. Like the Comanche ate a lot of uh, yeah. bear. I it was it was one that I harvested in Idaho, and these bears were all eating like wild wild plums. There was tons of wild plum oh. trees all over the place, and so it, I didn't think it tasted bad at all by any means. Like I, I would definitely do that again, but. I think it's just like that mindset of like, man, I'm eating something that eats meat. But like a bear, a bear is different. A black bear, especially like, I mean, a lot of the times they're eating berries and grass and like, like mm -hmm. the, the fruit tree, like plums or whatever. They'll they're op opportunists. So they'll eat whatever the hell they can come across and and live off of. But you know, I think like we have a pig ranch um, that I guide pig hunts on up in Northern California, and there's tons of blackberry trees, tons of mulberry trees green pastures because they run a bunch of cattle on it um and then tons of acorns too so these pigs like people i think a lot of the times get weirded out eating wild boar and they're mm -hmm. just like you know i think you go a lot of these coastal places where there's drought and like food's scarce they'll eat dead animals they'll you know even sometimes kill each other and live off of that you know and it's i think that's when you start seeing a lot of that really bad gaminess in the pigs and then also yeah like disease coming but these pigs up there are phenomenal, man. It's and I think it's because they're eating that delicious stuff year round, and they're not having to like scrounge around and trying to like find any type of dead animal that they can and live off of it. Um, and so that's what I try to tell people all the time. On, you know, I'm sure bears are kind of the same situation. You know, you got a bear that's in a place where it's tons of food and they're not struggling all the time. They're probably going to taste fine. Yeah, but, exactly. You, know, you got a bear that's 
scrounging and living in a trash can. There's not tons of other stuff. Or that's there and they just decide that's the easiest way to eat. They're going to go do that. You well, know, bears but. will eat rotten meat. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you, you get a bear that's been eating rotten meat, it's like apparently the nastiest bears are the ones who are eating rotten salmon. Mm. Like when they're, they're you know, like a, a salmon run and there's a they're bunch of dead, dead salmon and they, they eat the shit out of them. And then you, mm. like Ranella was telling me that he uh, borrowed a guy's smoker and he used it to cook some bear. And he said the smell of fish was so bad that he told the guy, hey man, you got to clean your smoker out. It just stinks like fish. And the guy said, I never cooked a fish in there in my life. No way. Yeah. And he's like, really? <laughs> and he realized like, oh my God, it's the bear. You know, he's younger at the yeah. time. Uh-huh. He didn't realize it was literally the bear had eaten so much <laughs> fish crazy. that its flesh smelled <laughs> it's like rotten fish. Mm. Mm. He said that one of the best meats he's ever had in his life was a bear that had been eating blueberries. Yeah, I could believe that. They say the blueberry bear is supposed to be just mm. spectacular. Hmm. I don't think I've ever eaten one, but I haven't. No, not like that. I've I've eaten bear uh, from uh, Alberta. Yeah, and it was really good. But That's... these are bears that just you know we're eating mostly. It depends on what they get. They eat a lot of fawns up there. Yeah, a lot of colts, a lot of fawns, a lot Dude, of my, calves. My buddy was just here in Northern California scouting uh, up in the B zone. And there's tons of bears up there. But I don't think people realize how many bears we have here in California. But he watched a black bear come into a canyon. He was he was sitting there phone scoping a, a buck. And there was a doe and a fawn over here kind of lower. And the bear comes up through the bottom of the canyon. And he, he looks over. He's filming it. And the bear sticks his nose up. And you can tell he gets uh, wind of the, of the deer. The buck takes off. And so he turns over and starts filming the buck still over here. And all of a sudden, like, Five minutes later, he hears that fawn screaming, and he pans over, and that bear was standing over the top of it, just ripping it. Oh, it's like crazy. And eating I, it while it's alive too. Yeah, oh yeah, it was screaming. Yeah. Oh, and so it's like, I guess people don't realize also how big of a predator bears are on the deer population. Oh, yeah. Like I guess you just think, oh, you know, they're probably eating more, um, you know, smaller game things, or if they find something dead. But no, they'll they'll hunt down and kill fawns even does or sometimes even bucks i've oh i got a good story dude it was an archery story years ago when i was young it was me it was opening day me and one of my team my wrestling teammates my dad and his dad went this way we go right we're coming up this dirt road and my buddy's like hey what's that under that tree right there and i'm looking and there's a bear just sitting there staring at us and he's laying over the top of a giant blacktail buck like big four by four and i'm just like what the and he takes off and so we run over there and i'm just looking at this thing and he that bear had killed that buck full grown buck like healthy like it was still warm like he had just killed it the only thing eaten off of it was the ass end was eaten off on it and uh i i did not know that i guess black bear at that time would hunt down and kill a mature buck wow and it was crazy to come up on it and just see it like it had just happened like we probably just missed it maybe an hour hour before that where did it could catch it right bucks are so fast and so nimble mm-hmm. but i mean and, and we were back in a spot where unless somebody poached it you know but i looked up front there was no nothing in the guts like i was actually looking to see if somebody had if done there's that. a wound somewhere yeah, yeah. nothing F- clean body everywhere just he had just chewed like the one of the back hams off. Wow, it was crazy. So he probably stumbled upon it or something, chased it down, and mm-hmm. got it. Wow, that's crazy. wild. Yeah. Dudley told me he saw a moose get its back broken by a grizzly through a scope. No way. Yeah, he was looking at it through a spotting scope, and he saw this grizzly chasing this moose and swats it on the back oh. and breaks its back. No way. They're just chasing it down, chasing it, just, oh, boom, yeah. snap, oh. and the thing goes down. Like That's how strong a grizzly bear is. Yeah, and people don't realize how quick they are. Oh, my God, like, so fast. We were talking about that. There, you see one, and it's like you just think of them kind of like a big, lazy, kind of slow. Dude, they can go. Yeah, they're, they're lazy get, until they're not. Exactly. Yeah. I've seen videos of them running down deer. Yeah, running them down, like closing the distance. A deer's like wide open, and they're just closing the distance. It is hard to believe because when you see them just sort of lumbering along, preserving energy, you just assume. But Mm -hmm. you know, they're masters of preservation. I mean, they literally sleep all through the fucking winter. (laughs) They eat so much that they can just sleep. Isn't that crazy? It's nuts. Just just the thought of a bear like going to sleep for that long and surviving in a hole, the whole just 
a bear's life is just so interesting to me. It is. It is a, it's a very interesting animal, you know, but the thing is people get so attached to bears. Mm -hmm. Like no one, they, there's not an animal that people get more mad at you Mm -hmm. for shooting in North America than a bear. I agree. Meanwhile, it's like, I guess people are just accustomed to people shooting deer you know, and they they understand. They see deer get hit by car. They see deer everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's rare that you see a bear because bears are a little cautious being around people. But mm-hmm. there's plenty of them. Oh yeah, tons and of them. They make a big dent on wildlife. And if mm-hmm. you don't do something to manage them, mm-hmm. like uh, my friends John and Jen live up in Alberta, and where where they are, like. There's bears everywhere up there. You can't imagine how many bears there are. And this is like really, really dense woods mm. up there. I see a lot of the videos of you guys up there. That's yeah, it's a everywhere. crazy place. Yeah. yeah, it's really crazy. But um, because of Canada and the lockdowns, they can't even get up there. Yeah. They, th- no one is allowed to hunt up there. You can't, mm-hmm. like people can't come across, most of their business was Americans mm-hmm. coming up to be- Alberta to hunt. And for the past two seasons in a row, they've had no income. Dude, that sucks. It's crazy. Are they taking care of them as far as, uh, I mean, what are they supposed to do? I mean, what are they doing the in that government? situation? Yeah, are they I don't think they do nothing shit. at all, huh? I mean, I can't imagine they do. I mm-hmm. mean, how would they, I mean, you, you, like their business is based on customers and then tips. Yeah. So like, how could someone take care of them? Like, what is it, what yeah. is someone gonna do? No. How could the government, Supplement that. Yeah, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what they've been, what, what they've been doing, but they're stuck. Yeah, like you can't even like they're if you come from Canada, they're great people. Yeah, I love them. Yeah. They, they're awesome. I love them too. Mm-hmm. If you come from Canada into America and then you try to go back to Canada, I think there's like a 14 month quarantine. And what? It, yeah. Oh, excuse me. 14. 14 was, excuse me. 14. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm using words wrong. Yeah. Uh, 14 day quarantine, <laughs> and uh, I think also your. Um, I don't even think it's that easy to come across. I think you have to have a reason. Mm-hmm. Like there has to be like some clear it's cut be work. Re- work yeah, because related. like I was just reading something about the border being shut down. So I don't know what it, that means. I, I think it is, and it like so. Um, Paul Bride, who does a lot of Kuyu's photography, he's up there, and he's. I know he came down kind of. I think that was last year, kind of in the midst of everything. And uh, at the time, it was essential workers only could come into the United States and he had a hunt that was uh, planned in California that he needed to get over there for to film for Kuyu or to do photos for and he came in he did the hunt and on his way back they like hammered him he was like he told us like they threatened like you are not an essential worker basically you are not allowed to travel if we catch you doing it again I think it was like what did he say like seven hundred thousand dollar fine oh. and and there was certain there was a certain amount of time in jail if if he did it seven hundred yeah seven hundred thousand dollars is what they told him and so and then he had to go quarantine for fourteen days away from his wife Jesus Christ <laughs> it's nuts it's, Canada is that you know it's, it's interesting how different countries handle these things mm-hmm. lockdowns and in different states you know in this in yeah. this country you're seeing differences on different like new york city just instituted a uh they have a passport essentially if you want to use a gym if you want to use and this is not even like a covid test like we test negative you have to be vaccinated which doesn't make any sense because if you're vaccinated you can still spread it you can catch it and you can still spread it like you can do rapid antigen tests it takes 10 minutes and you could find out whether or not someone has it. Yeah. It's not that hard. I mean, this is, they've been doing it now for a long time. Mm-hmm. The idea that you're going to have a vaccine passport, like a vaccine is the only solution to this. It's just, it's preposterous. I, I don't get it. I mean, the logic with some of this stuff is so ass backwards. You it's know? a lot it's of it's like, fear-based. You know, I, I people so, are just yeah. panicking and they don't know what to do. And they, they feel like, you know, this is a, a, a easy to follow solution. Mm-hmm. If everyone just got vaccinated, but that's not really the case. No. Because everyone would have to get vaccinated simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And then even then, there's a lot of articles that are out there now. There's scientific papers that have been written about vaccines that don't eliminate a virus. Mm-hmm. Like they still allow someone to catch the virus. Well, that can possibly lead to f- variants that are even stronger. Yep. The whole thing is... Fucked. And, and again, 
I hate to be the fucking guy who keeps beating a dead horse, but they never talk about your health. No. They never talk about losing no. weight. They never talk about exercise. They never talk about vitamins and all the things you can do to strengthen your immune system. Yep. Never bring it up. It's just a bunch of fat people eating McDonald's trying to get a vaccine. Get like This the is the only vaccine. thing you yeah, can get. It. Yep. It's crazy. It's so frustrating. It, it is. It is. Beyond. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, we could sit here and- Well, there's also people yeah. that have already had it. You know, people that have already had it and have antibodies, mm-hmm. they still want you to get vaccinated. Like, yeah. Jamie has antibodies from nine fucking months ago. Mm-hmm. Look at him, flexing. I just got tested. I had him too, bro. Yeah. Wow. Pound. What, what when was <laughs> yours was from February? February of last year, which I don't even know. I never got tested then. It was just the big hunt expo in Utah that we do every year. And I got extremely sick. And all all, all the symptoms were the same as COVID. It so been February flu, of 19? Yeah. Wow. So, uh, no. February of 19, there was no COVID yet. You sure? Yeah. So then it November would've... of 19 was when it was happening in Wuhan. So yeah. how would it have been in February? Oh, right, of course. Yeah, duh. See, again, I'm bad with numbers. No, that, I'm words. pretty sure that's when it was. So it, last no. year. 20, was. 20. It would have been 20. It would have yeah, been like while, while the pandemic was happening, right? You're right. Well, yeah. No, because right last year. the pandemic started. Well, the pandemic was March, right? right. So of you caught year? it. Yeah, March is when everything gotcha. shut down. Then it was February so last you, year. Sorry, you were sorry. at February of 2020, yes. right before everything Correct. shut down. Yes, right, yes. right, okay. That was it. So, I mean, maybe that doesn't seem so far fetched now. That's but, fucking long ago, yeah, man. It was that's a while crazy. Ago. But um, that really is crazy. Unless, unless it's more I, than a year. Yeah, unless I came across it again, I just didn't have any symptoms, and my body was just like. Well, yeah. SARS-CoV-1, right? The r- original SARS, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Uh, I don't know if they call it SARS-CoV-1. It's just SARS, mm-hmm. original SARS. People have had um, antibodies for that for years, you know? And um, they think that, well, it's li- with you, listen, if you got it in February of 20, mm-hmm. and here we are, how many months is that? 12, 13, 14, 15. That's a long fucking time, yeah. dude. More than a year later, you have antibodies. It's interesting. I, I was on an elk hunt uh, in New Mexico last November, mm-hmm. and uh, two of my buddies, like a day after we got back, tested positive for it. So maybe and I had zero symptoms, you were but asymptomatic. Maybe. Because you had the antibodies already from mm-hmm. February, and then it probably... Just went through your system. Wild that's speculation. What, I saw this I yesterday. Wanted. Wait a minute. Wild speculation on this show? Man. The fuck are you doing? <laughs> uh, they're saying the white-tailed deer have antibodies. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. If what? you eat that, would it show up, do you think? It's a good question. Dude. That's a good question. Very good question. I did not know that. That's crazy. Yeah, there's quite a few white-tailed deer they've tested that have antibodies. How the what? fuck are they getting it? What the Who's fuck? Who's coughing on deer? <laughs> right? How are they getting it? They're outdoors always, only, right? Yeah. Wait a minute. Maybe not. Maybe these are deer that were Farm in raised. one of them farms. Yeah, which it is, could have been. But by the way, a fucking petri dish of diseases. They think yeah. that's one of the main sources for CWD, really? like chronic it's, wasting disease. Yeah. They tested six hundred deer in one, two, three, four different states. Hmm. But where are they getting the deer from? Yeah, these so these keep getting wild. These got to be these got to be high fence operation. I'm guessing. See, but. if that's the case, you got a bunch of fat dudes that don't take care of themselves, <laughs> coughing on these deer that they're feeding. <laughs> I, I fucking have a real problem with that whole feeder thing, man. Yeah, it's people like sit in front of a feeder and wait for these deer to mm-hmm. show up. Look, it's one thing if you, it's just you're just getting meat and this is how you do it. Yeah, but you kind of shouldn't call that hunting. Yeah, you're it's, harvesting. It's killing. Yeah, it's you're killing. killing. You're killing. Yeah. yeah. Look, I'm all down for it if you you got invasive species like wild pigs and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. it's the Texas situation is very odd. Very odd. It's mostly private land, mm-hmm. huge ranches, giant. And a lot of people hunting over feeders. Mm-hmm. Like I was and talking to these guys like, "You hunt? Yeah, we hunt too." Yeah, my buddy's got a ranch. We sit in front of the feeder. I'm like, "Stop. <laughs> Done. Stop. Stop talking. <laughs> You're not hunting." You're waiting. Yes. Yeah, you're I waiting. Guess, I guess you got some of these like insanely thick, what do they call those? The, oh, uh, yeah. San, San, mm-hmm. Sanderos. No, Sanderos. Sander, what, Sanderos or something. They use a Mexican word for some strange yeah, reason. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> but really, I mean, how? I don't know how it's, you would hunt these deer outside of that, but you're right. They basically just dump a bunch of feed mm-hmm. down these clear cuts, like and a road, wait. basically, and yeah. then they get on the end of it and just wait. Well, it's similar to what they have to do with a lot of bear hunting. Yeah. Like, they bait because there's no fucking way. First of all, a bear's nose is so mm-hmm. ridiculously powerful. You're not sneaking up on them. No. 
It's like, yeah. how else are you going to get them? The only you know? way spot and stock works is if you have to go to an area where there's like a clear cut, where they have new uh, like greenery mm-hmm. coming through, and the bears like to eat that right after spring. Yeah. Or you find them when they're eating berries. Yeah. You know? but yep. Even then, like getting close enough to archery hunt them. Yeah. And it, yeah, because if it's thick enough to where there's no possible way to be quiet, like yeah. what are you supposed to do? I have but, friends in Montana that hunt bear, and there's no baiting in Montana. Mm-hmm. So it's like- Spring bear hunt is like you might go thirty fucking days, yeah, and never get close. Mm-hmm. And that's how we are in Cali. You can't bait, can't yeah. can't even run dog. They used to run a lot of dogs on them where they tree them, and mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I if if it's keeping the population down, that's cool, but it's not something that ever interests me to do. But right. You know, it, we can't do any of that anymore. So it's all basically spot and stock like Montana now. Right. And I bet archery uh, archery success in California has to be so low. I'm not sure, yeah. I know at Tejon Ranch they kill a few every year, and big ones too. Mm-hmm. But they use rifles. They were trying to outlaw bear hunting altogether yeah. last this, year, but they, yeah. they, they had that put the kibosh through. on yeah. it. Uh-huh. Well, when people started understanding the numbers mm-hmm. and go, hey, 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 do you know what the fuck you're talking about? Like, yeah. you, you're just, it's like Ronella always likes to describe bears as charismatic, uh, charismatic megafauna. And this is the thing about bears, because people think of them as like stuffed animals, yeah. or teddy bears, or yep. yogi. Mm-hmm. But if you're a person who lives on a ranch, you understand what these things really are. Mm-hmm. These are the things that eat calves yep. alive. Yep. These are fucking predators yeah. big giant fast moving predators and uh-huh. you have to control the population yeah yeah there has to be predator population control but there's period. a thing about laws that get passed in high population density areas where the people never have contact yeah like in bc they outlawed grizzly hunting but meanwhile people that i know that live in like rural bc are like mm-hmm. fuck mm-hmm. like you assholes in the cities <laughs> yeah. you just you don't even know what you're banning yeah. You're yep. banning hunting these things that you have to hunt because then they're going to hire people to kill them now. Yep. And so then these guides aren't going to make any money. The outfitters aren't going to make any money. More people are going to get their shit eaten. Mm-hmm. Animals. And more people are going to get attacked. Yeah, way more Because they're going to get less nervous around people because mm-hmm. now they're not going to think of people as being hunters anymore. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah. It's not good. Well, I mean, how few people really understand? I mean, other than talking about it on podcasts like mm-hmm. this one or on Meat Eater or on any other podcast where people have like common sense discussions about wildlife management, most people really have no idea. No, no clue. Right. No clue at all. And it's, I mean, it's not like they're going to go out of their way to get on the internet and start doing no. some research on it. It's just whatever they hear is what they, they know. Yeah. You know, and it, California is probably one of the worst places for that as far as that goes man mm-hmm. it's tough uh yeah. you know pe- people just like you said associate bears with the cute and cuddly they don't they have no idea that i mean i know now in la they're starting to figure that out a little bit because you're getting tons of coyotes even coming in and mm-hmm. killing people's pets and even attacking people you got mountain lions you know attacking people running and bike riding and killing them you know and i think there's even more and more bears now starting to to move in. Especially like around Pasadena, coast. jumping in people's uh, swimming pools oh, and yeah. shit. yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> but, I mean, it's the population's only going to get bigger and bigger and mm-hmm. bigger, you know, especially yeah. now. I know that when we could run dogs, when, when hunters could run dogs on killing bears, there was a quota that the state would put on amount of bear kills. Once that quota was hit through successful tags, they turned the season off. Mm-hmm. Um, and every year we would hit that quota, we haven't hit that quota since they stopped the bear hunting, which, or sorry, uh, dog allowing dogs to be hunted, uh, which has been years now. They don't. I, yeah. I've heard they get like half of it even. So it's like the population's just compounding. It's yep. getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's going to continue, continue that to way that. too. Yeah. There, because the people that are making the votes are all city dwellers. Mm-hmm. I mean, the amount of people that live in the cities, whether it's the Bay Area or in Los Angeles. It's like, you know, most of the population of the state. Mm -hmm. But the crazy thing is when you make that drive from Los Angeles up to San Francisco, you pass farmers. (laughs) It's all rural. They all have Trump signs up. (laughs) It's kind of weird. Right? It's like, like, is this really California? Like, what is this? It's crazy. Yeah. And then when you get up in your area, like Sacramento, Mm -hmm. man, it's a lot of hunting and fishing going on up there. People don't know. Sac North, it's um, almost like a, sorry, Sac North is almost like a different state. Yeah. It's, um. It's crazy, but uh, yeah, man. I 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if things are ever going to change for the state as far as that goes. I mean, if if there's not better game management, like our deer herd, California's deer herd is struggling big time. Yeah. We can't kill mountain lions, obviously. That's another predator that's just compounding. It's just continuing to get No management at all. Nothing. Yeah. nothing. Unless they kill pets and they get a depredation permit and then all the wildlife nuts mm. fucking threaten these yeah. people. And now they've even made some, like I said, my buddy, I have a buddy that's a county trapper and they've made it even harder now to take out problem animals. So like a, a mountain lion, say it comes in and kills a, a horse or whatever. Like it used to be, he killed my animal, I'll get a depredation permit. We either see it, we kill it, or we set a trap, catch it, kill it. Now it's like, I think there's like three strikes. Like it has to kill three times. It's like and a felon. Yeah. <laughs> It's fucking crazy, dude. My buddy's just like, this is absolutely insane. And it's not based, again, on sound wildlife management principles. Oh, We're emotion. wildlife biologists. Mm -hmm. It's people that don't understand what they're managing. Mm -mm. It's really, it's like having nuclear waste managed by stand-up comedians. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't know what the fuck yeah. you're doing? Like, yeah. why are you doing this? Yeah. They, they really don't know what they're doing. And- you know, in San Francisco, where they've killed a bunch of mountain lions that have killed people's pets and stuff, yeah. one of the things they found when they, they do necropsies on them, and they, they, they check out their guts, they find out what they've been eating. It's mostly dogs. Yeah. They're eating like 50% pets. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy, man. I, I, I don't know if we're ever going to do anything about it, though. That's the scary thing. Like, Bro, if a mountain lion ever killed Marshall, I would oh. I would become <laughs> the mountain lion punisher. I would, <laughs> I would, I would fucking decide. That would, I would dedicate my life to killing those cunts. Oh, yeah. I Dude, fucking... I, I've I already had one dog get killed by a mountain lion in Colorado. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, back in 2008... Or nine, two thousand nine, I guess it was. No way. Yeah. Just in your backyard. Yep. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Dude, bro, I see... they're fucking nasty cunts. Mm -hmm. I've seen nasty. videos on online of yeah, like I think they're like home cameras, like security cameras that catch it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's killing a dog. Crazy. Yeah, they kill a lot of dogs. I had um, and this happens all the time. You know, I'd go and ask permission landowners, and you know, usually it's these kind of sometimes it's an older lady and this one in particular was an older lady she had two little like white fluffy dogs and uh, I asked if I could could hunt on her property and she told me no and so I would just hunt the property next year I was just trying to expand the property that I could hunt and so I'd be out there and this probably was like months later she comes up to me I was out there scouting some deer and she's like uh you know I'd really like it if you saw these coyotes and shot them. Uh, my one of them, I, I watched them pull my dog away and ki basically killed it. It was one of her little white fluffy dogs, and it's like, man, it's it sucks that that's what it takes for a lot of these people. Like something traumatic in your life to be taken away for you to understand like the benefit of doing this. You know, like if I was able to hunt deer in your property, if you wanted me to kill coyotes, I would take care of them for you. You know, right? I keep the population down, but it's like. Obviously, I did it. I was trying to help her out after that, but it's like you know, we. I don't know. It's just to one keep of those population things. of coyotes down is a fucking oh, full dude, time job, son. I've heard, I've heard something crazy, and I don't know how true this is, but it's almost like uh, what was it? Like if you kill coyotes in an area and you bring the population down to a certain amount, they know that. And they can they rebreed yes to like in like double in size or like it's a hundred percent true yeah how crazy is yeah that? there's a great book called uh, Coyote America yeah, I think that's where yeah I've heard, yeah a guy named Dan Flores Somebody who's been on the podcast it. before is a brilliant guy who's um, so I believe he's a wildlife historian and he was a professor he was actually one of uh, Ranella's professors while he was at, in college and. Um, what happens is when coyotes yell at night, mm -hmm. it's basically a roll call. They're like, ah, rah, 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 rah. and they try to find out where everybody is. Mm -hmm. And when one of the coyotes turns up missing, the females have more pups. So gotcha. all the females that's breed more. Crazy. And that's one of the reasons why coyotes are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And apparently it was a strategy for coyotes to, um, to survive with gray wolves because gray uh, wolves pick hunt down coyotes and mm. kill them. And so because of this, the coyotes had to figure out how to expand their range to get away from the gray wolves and how to breed more, uh, more prolifically mm -hmm. uh, every time they got attacked by wolves. 
Gotcha. That makes sense. It's pretty wild shit, yeah. man, because the coyotes were smarter than the wolves because when they figured out how to kill off the wolves and what they would do is they would they would shoot a horse and then fill it up with strychnine and uh, like pump its veins with strychnine and then leave it there for the wolves and the wolves would eat it and die. Gotcha. But the coyotes like, Meh, not today, bitch. Yeah. And the coyotes kept expanding. So now coyotes are in every single state in every single city in the country. And a hundred years ago, they were only in the West. Really? Yeah, they were only in the West. I mean, this is a, a relatively short period of time. They've expanded through the entire state. It's crazy. They're, in, they're in fucking Manhattan. <laughs> They really are. What? You never seen it? No. There's videos of coyotes in Central through. Park. That's nuts. Pull that, pull that shit up because you need to see this because it's so bananas. It's they're they're essentially a small wolf is yeah. what they are, which is why the red wolf and coyotes have bred in some parts of uh, the South, and I think the Southeast, and they they've deve developed these hybrids that they call koi wolves. So ah. it's like a larger coyote. Mm -hmm. And and I've I've seen like in New Mexico they have Mexican wolves, mm. but they basically look like a big coyote. Mm. But I, I think that's another kind of probably of it. Of well, I mean, a coyote is a wolf. That's yeah. the thing that a lot of folks don't know. It, it is a wolf. Mm. It's just a small wolf, mm. but a really fucking clever one. Yeah. They're so really smart. sneaky. Yeah. And all these Native Americans have these, uh, look at this, these motherfuckers Dude, in, look at that, in Manhattan. What the? Fuck out of here. No way. Central Park, coyote. That's a healthy looking coyote yeah. too. Check out this coyote stalking his way through Central Park what? or its way. Wild, dude. Look at that. New York. New That's York crazy. Park officials no offer tips after coyote sighting in Central Park. Bro, they're everywhere. Wow. They're literally everywhere. They're in the Bronx. They've, saw, they've seen them in abandoned buildings in the Bronx. What the hell? Yeah. The fuck? <laughs> he darted it, look. Yeah. It's got a dart in it. Oh, wow. They jabbed him. Man, that's crazy. I had no idea. They're probably uh, tranking him, trying, mm -hmm. to, trying to capture him. Wild shit, dude. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, you know, and people that just don't understand hunting or population control... Uh, they get so pissed off. It's predators. It's a predator thing. Bears. I mean, you see these people, you know, I have buddies that go out and do these um, coyote derbies, basically, where in the area they'll bring a bunch of people in and everybody tries to kill as many coyotes as they can. And it's very extreme. I get that. But it's like in an area, you know, that's very highly populated with coyotes. It's something that can help control the population mm -hmm. very quick, yeah. you know. Um, and it's something that needs to be done. Yeah. If you want to keep your dogs alive mm -hmm. and, you, you know, you want healthy populations of deer and a lot of other wildlife, mm -hmm. like, you can't have an overpopulation of anything. Mm -mm. And the only thing that balances that out, other than nature itself, and the cycle of nature itself when it balances out, is a cycle of starvation and disease. Mm -hmm. Which, it's I mean, not I, good. No, not yeah. good at all. Not for good. anything. For anything. For anybody. Yeah, but that's how nature balances it out. The mm -hmm. only other solution is wildlife management. And that's where wildlife biologists do an accurate assessment, a survey of the area. They find out what the populations are, and they figure out how many of each animal that they can pull from it. Mm -hmm. So people don't understand, like when you're talking about getting a tag for moose. Yeah. It's not easy. Nope. It's not like anybody could just go to Alaska and shoot a moose. Yeah. No, it's fucking very difficult. Mm -hmm. Like some animals, like, like bighorn sheep, like, good luck getting attacked for them, right? Oh, yeah. I got lucky on one of those, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lucky dude. No, Ooh. dude, just, just uh, I mean, here's an example. of You were talking about the moose. I have a story of, uh, you know, I, I got the rack, you know, all cleaned up and everything, and I'm driving it home from my taxidermist, and this uh, Prius rolls up. And I'm not making that up because it's it's a it really was a Prius, and they roll up, and it's this big old fat chick. She's got, like, different colors in her hair. And I'm guessing it's her husband or boyfriend driving. And I'm just minding my business in the slow lane, just, just wanting to get home. You know, I don't want my nothing. I want, you know, obviously if I could have enclosed the whole thing, I would have just because I know it pisses people off in California. Right. And I'm driving, and this lady comes rolling up next to me, flipping me the bird, and she's cussing and yelling, and they whiz past me. And I'm just like, jeez. Oh, and so we start coming up on traffic, basically to where I'm trying to slow down because I don't want to, 
get into it with this chick. I know what she's trying to do. And then all of a sudden they slow down too. And I see her window start rolling down. She's got a big gulp that's like <laughs> fucking giant, you know? And I'm like, here we go. And she slows down high, uh, you know, enough to get right next to me, tosses it and just hits my windshield. Really? Just throws her big gulp on my truck and then they speed off. I'm just like, you bitch. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you don't, you don't know anything about that, you know? Like you just said, like that. Those Do you are... think that fatso only eats vegetables? <laughs> yeah, not a chance. I she... only eat hot dogs. Yeah, she probably just They're got... from a hot yeah. dog factory. <laughs> Dude, it's insane when I get comments like that. Why don't you just go to the store and buy your meat like everybody else and stop killing these animals? And it's like, Morons. is that is that real? Yeah, like, it's you so really... dumb really believe that like you really truly believe that and it's like it is the dumbest fucking argument of all time yeah. and you know who who have those, that argument more is people that live in other countries mm -hmm. that don't hunt at all yes that's why i notice a lot of it it's comes from weird man mm -hmm. where they just don't have any history of hunting they just think you're a cruel person mm -hmm. meanwhile they're eating beef every yeah. day it's oh yeah strange man you know, it's it's crazy man and i try i try to inform i mean if if they're willing to listen a lot of the times they're not you know they just like they don't care what the hell you say. It doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. They're just yeah. like fuck you. But if they're willing to learn, I'll sit there and try to inform someone. But dude, it's crazy the ignorance and just stupidity, like yeah. that some people have and will not will not listen to anything you try to say to. Not them. only that, they are never going to get an animal who lives a better life than like a wild deer that you mm -hmm. hunt. If you if you're eating meat and you're eating meat even from like the best ranch, mm -hmm. you're not eating anything wild. No, I mean it's, there's nothing wrong with ranchers. I'm not opposed to ranching, yeah. but if you're eating you're eating a, a wild elk that you you like, hunted and killed yourself, yeah. there's no better meat on planet uh, Earth. I agree, man, and, and no we, better for you and no more ethical because yeah. there's not a single one of them that dies of old age. Yep. it's never gonna happen. Mm -hmm. I agree. No, and it's, and it's it's not like they're not regulated. Like you, they know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, you know. Like, yeah, that's the thing. Like I think these people just assume that we're going. I, I, I envision it like us in a back of a truck with an automatic weapon, drinking some beers, you know, blasting some loud music and just mowing everything down. Like I, well, I think that's what they don't think. let them see <laughs> Texas pig hunting. Yeah, man. I know. <laughs> These fucking helicopters, helicopters out here. Yeah. It's wild. Oh, it's crazy. But te Texas is just, I mean, obviously the pig population is Bananas. insane. And yeah. it's like, there's not a lot of other options. You can try and poison them, but you're going to poison everything else in the ecosystem. Right. You can try and trap them, but pigs aren't stupid. No. You might catch one or two, but the other ones see it happen. And then after a while, they're like, fuck you, I'm not going in that trap. And it's like, so what else? What else do you do? You know. And well, so yeah, the the thing is, the people that are upset about it are not the ranchers that are losing literally millions of dollars in crops mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. Those people, they'll they're they're fucking furious about yeah. these pigs. Oh yeah. But it's a, such a weird animal. It's like an invasive species. Mm -hmm. It's, and they breed all year Dude, round. It's crazy. Like it's, we we I came to Texas years ago and we we did a pig hunt and I, it was um we were spot and stuck right before evening we killed. We killed a pig. What was it? Like we killed one of the pigs, and one of them ended up being like a really small pig, maybe like a forty or fifty pounder, you know, which is mm -hmm. a pig that stands about that high. And we're like, hey, let's let's clean this pig, and we'll put this on the smoker, and, and we'll let it smoke all day t tomorrow, and we'll have it for dinner tomorrow night. So when we cleaned it, dude. This thing already had piglets like it was already breeding as a 40 50 pound pig yeah at six months old they're yeah. viable it's crazy man and yeah it, i mean i think there was probably already eight to ten in it you know <laughs> and then within you know you said like six months those ones are already breeding again and yeah. they're how each one's having you know anywhere from six to 15 and then it's just like wildfire just keeps spreading somebody told me there was a new road that opened up somewhere in texas and uh the night the road opened they had 40 car accidents. Because of pigs? Because of pigs. Oh, no way. Because pigs had been using the area. Just travel. <laughs> just running back and forth. Oh, shit. People were just driving. Mm, bam. bam. Shit. 40. No way. 40 car accidents. <laughs> <laughs> Put some hog wire, man. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, I mean, just the, the sheer numbers <laughs> yeah. in this state are, are really crazy. And they're delicious. They are. I love this eating crazy. Pig. It's very good. I, like I said, that's one of the, the things that we do for fins and feathers. And it's, we guide people. I, I will personally at least go get one 
at least one a year and live off that. But I love wild pig. I love the chops. I mean, we'll do ground meat and, you know, I do pretty much anything you do with ground beef, but I'll do it with, with ground pork. I love it, man. It's good. And it's a robust flavor too. Yeah. It's a dark meat. That's the mm-hmm. other thing. Like if you look at pork, like domestic pork, it's like a really pale yeah. flesh, uh-huh. but wild pork is almost red. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's good, man. I do a lot of, uh, cooking videos I, I have a youtube channel and we do i basically film all my hunts i try to do like a my point of view from everything so i do a lot of vlogging and stuff but um my wife uh went and killed her very first big game animal with me and it was a wild boar on that ranch and uh like i said earlier it has there's tons of wild mulberry trees all over the place so she got this boar and then we went and picked a bunch of uh, the wild mulberries and i did like this i smoked i did the whole video if anyone ever wants to see it but uh, I smoked the whole like bone in um, uh, backstrap, like the the loin, and then I did like a mulberry reduction on it from those uh-huh. mulberries from the ranch. You fancy just, man! Yeah, it was fucking good, dude. There it is here. Oh yeah, there you go. But um, I don't think I've ever had mulberries. What a uh, mulberry! They're taste so like? sweet. Like really? I, I would. That's my hands down my favorite berry. Have you ever had a mulberry, Jamie? When these ones are ripe, I probably had one, but I, c- I couldn't recall it. Like, there's the boar. Oh, that's a big, is, that's yeah. a good size boar. Yeah. Was in this video too. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. We had a lion stalking in on us when we were stalking in on that boar. Really? Yeah, I, sh- I forgot about that one earlier when you asked. That's it. So, I, so I my this was Sunday morning. We're like stalking in on this these pigs, and I look behind us, and I'm like, "What the fuck is that?" Like 50 yards behind us, this cat. This cat was just cruising, and I don't know if he was, I don't know if he was chasing that buck earlier, but oh. dude, it just started like cr- just cruising. There's so many of them in California. When mm-hmm. I was at Tahoe Ranch, they had a, um, uh, a trail cam on one of their ponds, and they found 16 no. different mountain lions on the trail cam. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Well, that's what happens when you have a ranch, mm-hmm. a large ranch with no people, yeah. right? And a large deer, pig, elk, pig yeah. and they have cows there too. They run cows there too, and elk, and mountain lions unchecked. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing they can do about it. it sucks, it's, man. It's crazy, yeah. but it's just a really bad wildlife management practice. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, people think that like somehow or another these cats are endangered or something. It's, no. They're not at all. Yeah, not at all. Especially not in those rural areas. Mm-mm. There's a lot of them, man. Mm-hmm. When did you uh, start this uh, Peak Refuel Company? So this is- uh, This make great stuff, dude. Uh, it's, it's a really good company. It's really good. I appreciate good. it, man. Yeah, we um, last year was our first Mendez Mill launch. So I, I got to create, this is like super cool. Seth and Bart, um, you know, these guys go above and beyond with this stuff. And we got to do, I basically, I created two game meat recipes. We did an elk and we did a bison last year. And I create, I, like in my kitchen, come up with these recipes. I absolutely love cooking, by the way. Um, and then we go back and forth, turning it into a freeze-dried meal. And so that was the two meals that we did last year. And then this year, we added another one of mine, which is a venison meal. There it is right there. Boom, venison that country middle casserole, one. elk ragu pasta, yeah. and bison ranch mashers. And what is the difference between like food that's dehydrated mm-hmm. versus freeze-dried? Is it a taste thing? Is it a nutrition thing? So it's the way that it's done. But obviously, dehydrating... Um, you're basically sucking all the moisture, like the liquid out of it. Where freeze drying, you're not doing that. And so when you rehydrate uh, something that's freeze dried, like dehydrated stuff typically gets really mushy when you put water back into it. Mm-hmm. And so freeze drying doesn't do that. You know, you still have um, all the, the right textures, the right, um, um, basically all the right flavors too. And another thing that we do that's different is, Basically, like you, you got a mountain house company that's obviously been around for a long time, and that's like something I grew up using. That's really all there was back then. Um, but they're a lot of their stuff. Basically, they when they make it, they put all the ingredients in separate, you know, or they're, you know, it's not a lot of these other companies do that same thing. It's not like us where we have like a giant, basically like a pot. We cook the entire recipe and make it taste exactly like it's supposed to, and then dehydrate that. A freeze dry, or sorry, right? free, freeze freeze dry that into our meals. So it's not like we're doing all the different ingredients and then just adding them into a bag, shake it up, and there you go. Is it a more time consuming process? It is. It's more time consuming. But what's great about Peak Refuel is we have the the facility first of all, and we have all the giant machinery that 
a lot of these other companies, especially like the kind of the smaller companies that are doing these other game meets, you know, they can only do a handful at a time. And so it's hard for them to keep in inventory and stock where mm-hmm. we have basically the giant stuff. We can pump out higher numbers of it. Um, so we can keep up inventory, but also, um, you know, it's just for, we basically have the team that can keep up on top of, of being able to produce enough for everybody to keep it in their backpacks and how long you've been doing this for last year was our first year yeah so it so, was your first year or the company's for it was peak refuel Peak's been around so I, i'm not an actual owner of the company you just work with them. i work with them so okay. this is a company that i teamed up with last year and here it's kind of a cool story so they they haven't been around long i think they've been around i want to say three years four years now i was one of their very first customers ever Without, really? yeah, without knowing that, obviously, but I drew a tag here in Northern California or in Northern or in Northern California. So I was going to do a backcountry hunt uh, with a buddy of mine and he had heard about this company because obviously, like I said, the mountain house stuff, that's all we've ever used. But dude, that stuff fucks my stomach up. Like it's great if you like to fart. Yeah, dude, it's the <laughs> worst. And so I'm like, I, I don't want to be living. Alfredo, yeah. man. <laughs> You, good luck. Anything yeah. downwind of you, oh, yeah. you're going to start a stampede. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's horrible. It's so bad. And even after the hunt for like a week, I don't shit right. Like right. it's just bad. And so I'm like, dude, I don't really want to live off this stuff. Like I'm going to look into just making my own stuff. And he's like, dude, check out Peak Refuel. He's like, this stuff, it's all real ingredients. They They do it right. It's not like a ton of like preservatives. It's not like all this nasty shit. So I went on the website and ended up buying a bunch of their stuff for that hunt. And it's funny because Seth and, and Bart said that in the, that was like in the beginning of them where they would just sit there like basically waiting for orders to come through. And Seth, who's the owner, is like a big UFC fan. And he's sitting there and it's like, bling, an order comes through. And he's like, holy shit, Chad Mendes just ordered some of our meals and like freaked out, you know. And so he ended up writing a handwritten letter on and sending it with my stuff. And that's kind of how we ended up... Uh, like knowing each other and figuring each other out and dude it was cool i i contact we contacted each other and became like super good buds right off the bat like they're just great people man they're based out of utah hard workers they're you know they they have like amazing families it's just been something that i feel honored to be a part of and you know for me to be able to basically create my own recipes and pump them out there to people that for people to try and their game meets you know it's kind of something that's unique you're not really seeing that very often um it's, it's just been cool man it's been cool to be a part of that's awesome and how many different varieties do they have they have a lot of different stuff that you they, can... yeah the peak peak lineup is it's a bunch of different meals and then i just have my three as of right now so do they have snacks too or just they do and they're and we're actually working on some stuff for next year for some mendez snacks and stuff i have some cool ideas um for come yep oh, they just go. came out with with the sweets brownie bites cookie bites yeah I, when you know for people that don't know when folks go uh hunting or camping or any of that stuff where you're you're trying to pack as lightly as mm-hmm. possible it saves you so much weight to buy freeze dried things like exactly. that and mm-hmm. and keep them in your pack and you know you could genuinely keep a whole week's worth of food yep. in your bag and you know yeah. if you have a large uh backpack you yeah don't... and that's what we did like i did a doll sheep hunt in alaska last year and we were there for 10 days living out of our backpack and mm. that's you know i lived off all my peak stuff and uh basically you, you know you can just fold them up you have your day's ration like here's monday tuesday wednesday thursday or whatever it is and uh you know it's it's nice to know you can bust your ass all day and all these hikes you're just kind of snacking and then you have your peak meal at mm. the end of the day which is like your thousand calorie kick in the pants like that's where all your energy is going to come from for recovery from today and you know my energy for working hiking and traveling tomorrow so um man it was it's nice having that stuff for sure because they don't i mean they weigh just a couple ounces each bag, yeah so. it's incredible right when you think about the amount of calories mm-hmm. from just a couple ounces mm-hmm. and you add water to it just very minimal water most of them are like a cup to a cup and a half of water which is nice because a lot of the other meals like it requires a lot more which in the backcountry water is sacred man you, there's some spots you get into where there isn't any water so you really have to ration what you have and so you know only needing a cup of water to rehydrate an entire dinner or basically it's your full day's meal um, is pretty special so yeah just you basically we have a jet boil 
you know, it's a, it, a little contraption that basically boils that water real quick within like a minute or two. And you just pour it in there, mix it up, seal it up and set for like 10, 15 minutes and mix it. And it's amazing food right there. Super easy, convenient ready to go how many of your hunts are you doing rifle versus uh bow oh man i mean it it really varies year to year um i'd say probably 50 50 um some years more more archery some years more rifle this year um it's probably going to be uh, it'll probably be close to 50 50 which sucks doesn't suck but this fight now in october all my fall basically all my fall hunts are wiped out i got to buckle down and i had to cancel quite a few few hunts I that's got to be a, a kind of a weird bittersweet thing for you right mm-hmm. it is man because i mean hunting is has been it's it's been my true passion and my love for so long like since i was a little kid my dad got me into it and uh um you know every september i'm out chasing bull elk with a bow and this is going to be the first year in a long time where I'm sitting back just watching all my buddies get out there and do it and um, not being able to do it. But me and Dillashaw actually have a hunt in October, like right after my fight. Uh, fingers crossed, nothing breaks hand-wise, but we're going to go to Colorado and we have a, a mule deer elk hunt. Oh, nice. Right nice. after. So, so uh, me, that'll be mule deer in the rut? Yep. Yep. Second season, which I think this year Colorado, the whole season shifted. Mm-hmm. So I think it goes uh, right there at the end of October and in that first week in November. So that's that should nice. Be, should be if they're not in full rut, which they probably won't be in full rut, but they'll be they'll be acting ready. Is Colorado doing things differently as far as like over the counter tags? I had heard that they're changing mm. some of their uh, over the counter archery tags, and I, I I haven't heard, but I would. I mean, I'm, stuff changes in every state every damn year. I feel yeah. like you know, but. Um, what were, do you, what did you hear? What Making you, it more, more difficult to get tags that they're going to have draws instead of just playing over the counter. Yeah. I think a lot of areas they probably would do that. Um, which, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, it helps in a lot of ways, but it also sucks in well, a lot of ways. I think but. the pandemic really opened up a lot of people's eyes to the possibility that there might come a time where you don't have any mm-hmm. food at all. And, uh, like, how do you get food if you don't know how to hunt? And yep. a lot of people are like, you know what? I should probably learn how to hunt. So, mm. obviously, gun sales went through the roof. Oh, yeah. But a lot of people also took up archery and yep. started, you know, bow hunting and for I the think, first time. I think a lot of guys like you and Cam and Dudley, you know, is, it, you've really shown such a positive light on archery hunting and hunting in general. I think... I mean, so another business is fins and feathers. That's the hunting and fishing. I basically guide people, um, and which is pretty badass because you can it. literally go on a hunt with you. Yeah, it's so much yeah. fun, man. It's it's been awesome being able to like share that passion and just teach people. But what I was gonna say is what you just said is last year with COVID, our, that was our best year we've ever had with fins and feathers. We had more people interested in hunting and going hunting and fishing last year than we ever have. And Did we, you test them at all? No. <laughs> you just said, fuck it. Fuck it, let's, man. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Wow. Um, but yeah, we had it was it was awesome, man. We had a ton of people that had never hunted before, mm-hmm. and they're like, look, we watch Meat Eater all the time, or Nella. We've been seeing Joe do a lot of this stuff. I watch Cam. I've always wanted to get into archery hunting or hunting in general, and I think it's basically because people were starting to realize, like, fuck, if, if shit hits the fan, I need to know how to hunt. I need to know how to go out and provide for myself. And we had so many first time hunters last year that booked with us. And it was pretty, pretty damn cool to see, you know, these people that are complete city slickers coming out there, you know, and we had guys show up in like tennis shoes to go hunting. And I'm like, dude, you should have, I told you to bring boots, but you know, and you know, did you have to teach them how to shoot everything? Um, take them to a range. How did you do it? I, I guided them a bit beforehand, told them what they needed to do. Get out there, sight your gun in at a hundred, make sure you're comfortable shooting out probably two or 300, you know, and then when they show up, we take them out. I make sure that everything's dialed make sure I, you know, they're doing what they need to do. Um, but they've all taken their hunter safety course. So they've gone through that. Um, but then basically just, you know, hold their hand throughout the whole hunt, you know, and kind of basically just guide them, you know, leading the way, like, Here's an example. It was a pretty cool example. We had a kid, a young kid that booked with us last year on our cow elk hunt up in Oregon. And he was a huge uh, fan of Ranella's and loved, you know, the meat eater podcast and, and the show. And he wanted, uh, it was a cow elk hunt. He wanted the entire, like kept all the organs and, but 
you know, it was his first time going out hunting. And first morning I get him on two cows, you know, 150 yards, just standing there across the canyon broadside. And I get him on the shooting sticks and he's, you know, never, ever been in this situation in his life. And I look over and he's just like, <laughs> shaking like oh, a leaf dude, like not even close like not, he didn't shoot obviously it was just like we sat there for like five minutes and they're staring at us and he's like <sighs> just heart beating out of his chest and mm. I, you know and I, I forgot I guess at that point I kind of forgot what that feeling feels like I still get excited on hunts but I, I haven't been that excited on anything since probably I was a kid you know and I'm just like thinking back like god I kind of missed that. Had that he ever excitement. done anything that made him real nervous before like that? I didn't ask that, but it seemed like probably not. Like he, <laughs> he was a pretty, you know, pretty fragile looking kid, you know, just yeah. a young guy. But That's a big thing to do for your first really nerve wracking experience mm -hmm. to pull the trigger and yeah. end the life of an animal and then hunt 100%. it and eat it. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And he'd. I mean, even when he killed, it was a very emotional thing. He was, you know, he ended up getting one a couple of days later, but... Um, yeah, it was a pretty emotional thing for him and, you know, very appreciative. How did you get him to calm down for the, the, the hunt a couple of days later? Hmm, man, we had so many missed opportunities. <laughs> I'm sure. Was, dude, I got him a whole, this was probably opportunity number three or four. We pop up over this res and there's about 40 head of elk, about 20 yards from us. No joke. I could have thrown a rock and hit one. And I'm like, dude, there's no time for shooting sticks pick that cow that's all the way to the right just pull up and shoot and they're just standing there staring at us like getting ready to bolt but 20 yards and so he pulls up over the rise and shoots and misses <sighs> and they run out about you know 20 yards and they're basically trying to jump this barbed wire fence to get down into the draw and when there's that many head of elk it's it becomes like a traffic jam you know mm. it's like they're all having to take their turn to get over so I'm, there's a couple in the back still just standing there and i'm like dude pick one of those shoot so he doesn't even jack a bullet in there i have to like reload the gun because oh. he's just like pulls up again shoots misses oh no i jack another one in it's his last round in the gun and shoots a miss we empty the gun he misses doesn't get an elk on that one and that whole herd runs down and disappears <sighs> and so you know i just got i just had to talk to him you know like hey man it's it, this is part of hunting especially because right. it's your first time like yeah I've been there, like, don't worry about it. And he's getting bummed, you know, because, you know, you only get so many opportunities on a hunt, and I, I want him to go home with something, but we're kind of getting down towards, I think he ended up killing on the last day. So we're getting down to the wire here, and uh, finally we found one that was bedded up, and we, like, came in and just sat on it for, like, an hour before it finally got up, and it fed out into a clearing, and he, he was sitting, and I put the tripod up, and he got – a very, very steady shot and made a perfect shot and dropped it. Oh, well, so. that's a very big change for him, right? A big mm -hmm. confidence booster, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. Once he's done it and experienced it and yeah. knows what it's like, mm -hmm. it's so hard for people, man. It's so yeah. hard. It is, man. It's a difficult thing. It's like yeah. the fact that you're taking a life of something is hard in itself. And then if you've never been like an athlete or somebody that's been put in that moment of truth, situation to where you have nerves and you have to figure out with your mind going into that red zone like calm the fuck down you know what it takes for you to get out of that red zone and get into that calm state right if you don't know how to do that you're just like what do ah, i do what is this you know yeah. yeah it's complete chaos and so you know it's it's cool being able to for me to like kind of teach a lot of these people that have never done it before and just kind of, you know, get them through that situation and then gain that confidence, have them gain that confidence after the fact. And and then not only that, now you have all kinds of amazing meat to feed your friends, your family, and live off for the rest of the year. Like, how cool is that? Have you had guys uh, do it for their first time and then come back again yep, and become more seasoned? He's and, one of them. Oh, he, he's coming go. back. He, he booked, uh, we have a moose a moose hunt up in uh, Newfoundland this year. Oh, wow. And he's going to go do that with That's us, supposed so. to be a great place to hunt mm -hmm. moose. Yeah. Johnny Cash hunted moose up there. Really? I didn't even know that. There's a cool picture of Johnny Cash from like, I want to say it was like early 60s. Yeah. Like dressed like normal. No you know, way. Like wearing like farmer clothes <laughs> with a the with a flannel. wood. Yeah. Oh, there yeah. It is. Look, look at, at that. that fucking, Dude, look at that, that is awesome. radio he's got. He's got his collar popped. Yeah, he does. He's got his yeah. collar popped. He's got a <laughs> jean jacket on, it looks like. 
Dude, hunting moose in Newfoundland. I'm gonna have to do that. Yeah. I Apparently, it's a, a very moose-rich environment, yeah. right? Is mm -hmm. that the story about up there? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how hard is it going to be to get up there? So the situation right now is uh, if everybody's vaccinated. Um, so luckily, we we only have uh, four clients. Three of the guys are from Canada. Okay. So they're good, and they're all vaccinated anyways. And then this guy was vaccinated. So basically just to go do the hunt. Wow. Yeah. Some dedication right there. Yeah, and what about you? Do you have to fly in and uh, do you have to quarantine or test or anything like that? I'm actually not going on that one. So that one is um, um, basically we're, we're working on, I think, Scotty Lago. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a pro snowboarder. Oh, okay. He's going to be our guy on that one to go out there and hang with everyone and hunt. Oh, interesting. So, so you have um, other guys that work for you as guides as well. Yep, yep. How many guides do you have that you work oh, with? Oh, man. And the, these guys, like the we call them the pro staff guys. They're basically just, you know, different UFC fighters. We have actors, pro ball players, Scotty, snowboarders, kind of a just mix of celebrities, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that – basically we subcontract guides that already have stuff up and running so there's going to be professional guides they're guiding um and then we just send our group and our pro staff guy to go out there and hunt with them and they hang out shoot the shit around camp um you know basically the idea with fins and feathers was creating that camaraderie that you don't really get anywhere else except for hunt camp you know you've been there you've seen it you felt it you know you sitting around a campfire at night whether you're, you know, someone singing, playing a guitar, I've had that happen where, you know, everyone's kind of having some drinks, hanging out, telling stories. Like, you can't really get that anywhere else, man. You go through the highs and the lows of the hunt, you know, and you can go to an autograph signing, meet these guys, shake their hand, maybe take a picture, and then it's that's pretty much it. Is like, it a weird thing, though, when you go uh, take a guy out of the woods that you don't know? It, you know, like, it you can, don't know who's going to fall apart. You don't know who's going to be in shape. You mm -hmm. don't know who can't handle pressure yeah and that i mean that happens you know as far as having somebody not be a like a cool dude we've had thank god we launched this back in 2015 we haven't had anybody like really weird <laughs> that was always my concern like you know yeah some, hey, hey, like wake up in the middle right. of the night like, some fucking crazy person yeah. that you're no everyone's been with. cool that way but yeah um but yeah i mean we've had guys fall apart on hunts like i've there's been pig hunts where we have guys that are you know a little bit overweight or a lot of bit overweight and it's tough for them to mm. get to certain places and yeah they we see animals and they're like i'm sorry dude i just can't i can't do that you know and it's i think i think it's a good thing for these guys though because it's a slap in the face it's like that really shows you you know in that moment like fuck i gotta change my life you right. know there's things i need to do different because this is ridiculous like i'm not gonna go be a successful hunter and fill my freezer because I can't physically get to the damn thing, you know? Mm. So I, I think he ended up getting one later. Um, but he even said after he's like, man, this is, this is a definitely, uh, eye opening for me. So I had to change some stuff. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I've talked to guys who took a, uh, a hunter out like guides who took a hunter out one year and then, you know, the guy was just absolutely exhausted. Then the guy comes back next year, 40 pounds lighter yeah. and realizes yeah. like, that's yeah, pretty cool, how to man. Make some changes. Yeah. yeah. Like I, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do fins and feathers. Like a, you know, it was something that I decided like, how could I make some money doing something I absolutely love in the outdoor industry after I'm done fighting? And so that was kind of the main thing. But then also how do I share this passion with so many different people or teach this to people that have never had it in their life? You know, I have tons of buddies that their dad's never hunted. Like there's nobody in their life that even would introduce them to it, but they're like excited to learn, you know, and there's a ton of clients that come in that are in that same situation. Like, dude, I've, I've never hunted. I've never fished. You know, my, no one in my family ever did it. I didn't know how to do it. How do I get into it? So I show them how to go through their hunter safety course. And then, you know, then they come out and hunt with us and I teach them like, okay, this is what stocking is. And like, we break it down. And, you know, after the harvest, this is how we field dress them and, 
get the meat all prepared and take it home. And then what's su- super cool is that I get pictures all the time from these guys, like of recipes they've created with those animals. And, you know, it's them and their families and everyone just super happy, man. It's like so heartwarming for me to be a part of that type of journey for someone that had thought that they could never get into it, you know? It's just yeah. fucking cool. I That's like very cool. That's very cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's an immensely satisfying thing when you, you can go out and get your own food. And then when you're eating that, you're never going to forget the experience you had like the difficult times you had you know hunting stalking Mm -hmm. just the physical fitness aspect of it i mean that's the the thing that people a lot of people just don't know how much cardio it takes (laughs) to do a mountain hunt Mm -hmm. like you have to be in some serious shape i remember the first time i went with ranella we we went to uh montana Mm -hmm. and we were in the missouri breaks you know uh and we were you know going through these hills and mountain ranges and I remember at the end of the day, you know, we had hiked for like fucking eight hours. Was that the mule deer hunt? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I and that. I remember like thinking like, holy shit, like <laughs> this is, I'm like, I'm glad I work out. Like this is crazy. Yeah. If you're a person who doesn't ever work out at all, like how hard is this? It's hard, man. We it, It's difficult. And then, you know, even on these elk hunt, like I, I'd say elk is probably one of the yeah. hard, one of the harder for sure, especially if it's a pack in type hunt. You know, A, because it's a big animal, you harvest that thing, like you said, 15 miles back in there. It's a lot of fucking work getting that meat out, you yeah. know? And, uh, you know, I think that's probably the pinnacle of it. But, yeah, mule deer hunting, you're, you're in those types of situations you've never been in before, hiking those big-ass mountains. Dude, it's crazy. That doll sheep hunt we did last year, I'd say that's probably the hardest hunt I've ever done. We did just over 90 miles in 10 days of hiking. Oh, God. And we went up and over like four <laughs> four or five different mountain ranges. I remember oh, the first God. day we hiked to the one and we're glassing. And a fucking doll sheep's bright white. So you can see it on that dark open hillside like 20 miles away, you know? Right. And it's like, oh, there's definitely sheep over there. We're going to have to get a closer look though. <laughs> so you see like one, two, three, four mountain ranges and our guide's like, you see that that fourth range? Yeah, we're going to go up and over that by the end of this. And we, me and my buddies all look at each other like, the fuck we are? I'm not <laughs> doing that shit. <laughs> like, can we get a helicopter or something? You know? But, you, you know, you break it up. You're doing 8 to 15 miles a day, depending, you know. And it's just, I mean, I remember there was days where the climb was so long. You're climbing, and it's one of those, like, step, kick your toe in, step up step kick your toe in step up and you're doing that for like five hours straight you know you Uh. take a break every once in a while sip you know do snack whatever you do and then you're just kicking toeing up kicking toe are you using mountaineering boots uh yeah i mean uh no 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 no. i mean i'm i'm using very stiff soled boots um i think that when i was using the some crispies that you know it was a very very high end basically meant for the sheep type terrain how do you know like uh, i wear crispies too a lot of times um wh- how do you know what boot to choose for a hunt like that do you because if you've never done a doll mm-hmm. sheep hunt before i basically asked around i have a bunch of buddies that have done a lot of that stuff and it's you know obviously i can do some research online but it's typical online like you can get an answer over here that's one way and then you can get an answer over here that's completely different so for me it's i wanted to i, I like asking buddies that have actually been there and done it Mm -hmm. firsthand um and so i i had a bunch of buddies that had hunted in alaska and they kind of all steered me towards um i don't know it was maybe like two or three different boots and then i just basically chose one of them and went with it um you had to break it in first i did i i got i got those boots probably three months but maybe two months before my hunt and uh was just loading up my my kuyu pack and basically crushing it daily with with a hike there's a good area close to my house that basically it's fucking straight up and straight down for like four or five miles and you hike down to the river and then you're basically hiking straight back out of this canyon and that's what I would do for training with you know obviously leading up I would start off with a lighter amount of weight and then as I got closer I was getting heavier and heavier and heavier until I think I was at like 70 or 80 pounds in my pack and um, that's what I was doing at the end and then I think my pack was about 55 or 60 pounds total with everything, gun and everything, water. Um, and that's basically what I was packing around out there. So, 
Dude, people brutal. don't know. They yeah. don't know how hard it is, yeah. right? And I didn't fucking get one. That's that's <laughs> the you know that's that's part of the hunt. You know, we did over ninety miles. We were back there living out of a backpack for ten days. Did you get close? And, well, we saw over one hundred and fifty sheep. There's tons of sheep, but there was a huge winter kill off. Uh, that year of all the mature rams. So for people that don't know, a, a doll sheep ram has to be of legal age. So it has to be at least eight years old. And how you tell, and this is the most fucked thing ever, is you have to get close enough to them and count the rings uh, that are on the their horns. Rings. Yeah, the growth yeah. rings. And it's like they have false annual, false ones, basically. So, you know, basically what the guide was telling us is sometimes – when so basically how they get these rings is when they go through winter and food is very scarce and their body goes into basic like shock they're pretty much like so run down that all their energy source goes into staying alive so their horns stop growing and then when snow melts off and things start getting green and lush and life gets easy again they're like fuck okay and then they start growing and so that's what causes those rings every year they go through that winter they get that that ring um, and this, you know, this is what the guide was telling us is sometimes, you know, the snow will start to melt off and the, you know, stuff starts blooming and they start thinking, okay, shit, it's time to start growing again. Their body starts growing. And then a huge winter storm will come and be like, psych and just <laughs> fuck, like fuck them up. And so basically it'll cause those false annuli, which if you don't know what you're looking at, sometimes you're like, oh, that's definitely a ring. And guys kill sheep that are seven years old, not eight. And you're screwed, man. You're gonna you're in so much trouble. You lose, you know, they take it from you. You lose your hunting license. You get fined. I think there's even some instances if it's bad enough, jail time. Like it's like really? legit, yeah. And so, wow. you know, and it's it's not. You have to so in Alaska. You have to have a guide with you. You you can't just go out there as a non-resident and hunt. So you have to have a guide. Your guide obviously has to know the age, and it's on you too. So if I listen to my guide and he's like, oh, it's definitely eight, shoot it. And we walk up and it's seven, I'm fucked too because I listen to my guide. I have to, like, it's on me and him. Wow. And so it has to be eight broomed off, meaning like the tips are broken off, or um, a full curl. So the tips of the horns have to come up and break the line of its, like, the profile of its. So neck. eight and shitty horns, you mm -hmm. still can't shoot it? No, if it's eight, you can still shoot it if you can count eight rings. Okay. So if, even if he has shitty genetics and it's like a half curl, mm -hmm. but he's eight. He's legal. Or if he's five and just great genetics and he's a full curl, he's legal. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Or if he's busted off, they call it broomed. And I don't know why exactly that makes him legal. I'm guessing they figure the mature rams are the only ones that get so long. That, well, I guess it makes sense. He probably was full curl. And what they say is it starts blocking their vision, so they bust those off. Oh, really? To break it down here so that now they can see. How do they break them off? On rocks and... Huh. Even feeding in areas where they're eating like some of the lichen and you know, I think they're rubbing on rocks when they're those real mm. long rams. Speaking of lichen, have you ever done a caribou hunt? Mm -hmm. I want to. Me too. That's definitely on the bucket list. That's too. a crazy, Let's go do one, crazy though. hunt, man. Yeah. You know, I've heard just the terrain, like mm -hmm. making your way over those weird patches. What do they call those things where you're, you're st they're, they're essentially like small stumps. But it's like moss, and in between them, it's like marshy. And yeah, so, I know what you're talking about. it's supposedly a nightmare to traverse because mm -hmm. you're stepping on these things, and everywhere you go, you could jack your ankle. Uh -huh. yeah. And then, if you're packing out, like if you shoot a caribou, <laughs> and then you got to get it out of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I I've uh, I know Ranella's done quite yeah. a few of them up there, and it looks awesome. It looks awesome. It looks like a tough hunt for sure. Like it can be yeah. as far as even finding them. Mm -hmm. But I've also seen hunts where they come across that migration, and there's just thousands of them. Yeah, everywhere. they just catch it perfect. Mm -hmm. The other thing is with Alaska. Alaska is really interesting where you can't hunt the day you fly. Oh uh, yeah, that, that's so right. if to fly, and then like if you fly and land, and then you're are there when the migration hits mm -hmm. you're like fuck <laughs> and then you yeah, have to put. yeah you have to literally f go follow them mm -hmm. and then again like we said traversing that stuff is a nightmare they yeah. might have moved 30 miles down the yeah. road yeah and so you have to and the huge wide open expanses where these these caribou are roaming through too yeah it looks wild yeah. up there it's cool and I, i've eaten caribou and it's amazing meat too that's what i've heard yeah it's really i haven't good. had it but i've heard yeah. it's incredible Brunella did uh, a hunt up there with tim ferris and uh a, a grizzly 
smelled their meat and started running towards them and no. he had to scare it off. No way. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's all on video. It's fucking wild. Rinell's had a few grizzly encounters on video. Two two on video where they had to scare them off with guns. And then, of course, the one on a Fognac Island where they didn't mm-hmm. capture it on video because they were, they were actually eating lunch when the bear bum-rushed them. Oh, dude. Yeah. That's crazy. He's been around so many. We we saw a couple up there on that sheep hunt. Uh, I think we saw two grizzlies and a and a big black bear, but they were way the fuck away. Thank God. They're a strange thing mm-hmm. to behold, right? They're huge. They're so big. I can't imagine one of those things like on top of you. Like you're, you're not doing anything. You. Nothing. You're not doing anything to that. No. You're screwed. No. And you know, and it's uh, my friend Clay Newcomb. He's been on the podcast before. He put out a video recently on. Uh, bear defense whether or not you should have bear spray or a pistol Mm -hmm. and it's just like i've i've heard both work and i've heard instances where neither work Uh uh-huh it's like what Uh. do you do (laughs) and again like what's the caliber Mm -hmm. do you take some guys say a nine millimeter actually penetrates better and some guys say you want a 45 Mm -hmm. because you want more hit like yeah, I've heard people shooting and bullets deflecting off off their heads yeah Yeah. it's so thick like uh, fuck <laughs> no, oh. no thanks. Such a crazy way to go. A, yeah. a lady got killed recently who was a biker. I think somebody she was, was a telling. cyclist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very. I believe it was a lady, but there's like this uh, cycling path that uh, is very popular, and you know a lot of folks take this cycling path. They bike, mountain bike, and then they stop in this one spot and camp. And this bear went into her tent, pulled her out, and killed yeah, her. Dude, that's one of my biggest fears. I think about that shit every time I'm camping. I'm it's a good like, fear. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, scoot away from the edge of the tent. When you do an archery hunt, do you do you pack a gun? Yeah, so like Montana, you know, anywhere there's grizzly. Mm-hmm. If I and I don't know if you're supposed to, but you know, it's like I think if I go to a state. And I know that there's tons of grizzlies and you're not supposed to, I'll take the fine over getting eaten alive, you know? And I don't <laughs> you know, it's like Yeah. What what caliber do you bring? I think I, I think I usually bring a forty the forty five or the forty even I've brought, but uh, dude, it's like mm. I don't know. It's I've heard I've heard bad things about all calibers, but Yeah. Yeah. I wanna bring a missile launcher. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Can I just pack a rifle? <laughs> Can I have a bazooka? <laughs> They're oh, so man. fucking big. I don't. I don't think people realize how big they are until you see one. Mm-mm. We were in Montana with my family a few years back. We went to this. Um, they have like a sanctuary for for grizzlies, and you can go there and you pay and you watch these grizzlies. I don't know if they they were problem bears that they captured. I forget mm-hmm. what it was, but one of the things that they did is they gave these bears frozen watermelons. So they had a frozen watermelon. I'm just chewing on. They tear it apart like it's nothing really it's basically a boulder right it's a rock of ice but it's a frozen watermelon and this bear just grabs it it like like it's nothing man that's your skull like oh my god yeah yeah Yeah, your 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 skull is yeah like a zit it's gonna pop (laughs) it's horrific watching that thing eat the watermelon but it was such an eye opener Mm -hmm. because i was like okay Mm -hmm. yeah because you know we have this idea about physical strength of anything based on our own physical strength so we seem well i guess it's stronger than me but how much stronger yeah dude in an impossible to imagine level of strength yeah that's crazy just biting right through a frozen watermelon like it's nothing and that's that's that thing not even like angry or scared yeah like exactly if if relax if yeah if you Bumped into that thing and it was terrified and it was coming after you that's amplified even more you know like that's yeah. such a fear of mine, just coming around a corner. Like, even in Alaska, ask all my buddies. Like, I'm just terrified. I'm like, I'm going to go in the middle of the pack. Like, you let you guys go up there, but I don't want to be the last one in line either. <laughs> yeah. You know? Have but, you ever encountered wolves? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, that Montana hunt, we'd, me and a buddy of mine, we had just stalked in on a big bull that was screaming with his cows. And I, I closed the distance and flung an arrow right over his back. And was we hiked out that morning, just tails tucked and we come up on this big sage flat and there's a group of antelope i don't know probably 200 yards in front of us and we just sit there and we're watching them feed and they ended up just feeding out of view and we take one more step well there was a big ass wolf like 20 yards in front of us laying under a tree in the shade that we didn't see because we were focused on the antelope 
And we take one step and that thing jumps up and just takes off in front of us out through the wide open sage flats. Dude, that's another thing that people don't realize how big, I mean, I didn't know. Like seeing one of those things in person, you're like, holy shit, that thing is huge. How big do you think it was? I mean, I would guess that thing probably 180 pounds at least. Really? Oh, it it looked huge. Like bigger than any dog I've ever seen. Wow. It was giant. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Fuck, it could have been 200 pounds. It could have been 120 pounds, but it looked giant. Probably a little lighter than you think. Yeah, probably. Because they're but... fluffy and, you know, they have all uh-huh. that fur. But... It's head on it. I mean, it looked like it was like this, just like a big old dome. But it, I mean, I'm sure it was thinking about eating some of those antelope that we came up behind them, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, But no, it was... I only saw one once in Alberta, but it was at dusk, and I just saw it run across a road. I was mm-hmm. like, "Is that a dog?" Oh shit, it's a wolf! Yeah. It was it was little too big to be a coyote. Mm-hmm. I think. I mean, it might have been a coyote, but I'm pretty sure it was a wolf. It was yeah. a little little too big. I've always had something for wolves and werewolves, actually, which is crazy. <laughs> like that movie. Like I grew up watching American Werewolf in London and American Werewolf in Paris, even like. Mm-hmm. But that, like my mom. How dare you mention the two of those? In the I same know, times. I know. It's not the same movie, <laughs> but um, I yeah. remember as a kid that always terrified me more than anything. But I, I liked watching it. I don't know. It's fucking weird, but. Like the the thought of a werewolf, like that was always something that scared the shit out of me. Even like going in the woods at night when I'm hunting, like hiking out or like that shit still scares the shit out of me. Not necessarily a werewolf, but yeah. just the thought of like a wolf or a bear. But I think the thing is that wolves like coyotes, we were talking about coyotes being so smart. I think wolves are so smart mm-hmm. that a lot of times people decide there's no way an animal can be this smart it must be like a person that turned mm-hmm. into a wolf mm-hmm. i think that's what they thought of yeah. i mean that's just a thought but it's just so strange that this myth persists but it doesn't persist with other animals right yeah like there's not a lot of like myths about a person that turns into a bear mm-hmm. or a person that turns in i mean there was that one movie cats do you remember that movie <sighs> with david bowie yes see these eyes yes. so green <laughs> remember that <laughs> Oh yeah, I can oh. see for a thousand. Miles. I always think of the labyrinth too with with mm-hmm. him, but with Bowie, yeah. yeah. But he had a that movie was it what was that lady's name Natasha Kinski is that mm-hmm. her name? Yeah. Really hot lady yeah. from the 1980s, <laughs> who was a I, I think it might have been in the 70s. Fuck, what was that movie from? Cats. I I remember the name Cats, and I think yeah. I've probably seen stuff. I bet if we watch it today, we'd probably die laughing. Yeah, oh yeah, it's probably super corny special yeah. effects. Cat people, is that what it was? Oh, cat people. Cat. Was that? Uh, maybe not. I, I type, yeah, yes. Cat people? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tasha Kinski, what a Malcolm dumb McDowell. name. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm McDowell's in there from Clockwork Orange? Really? Let me see this. There it is. Oh, Natasha yes. Kinski. Nata- yep. Oh. Well, let me see some video from this stupid oh. movie. <laughs> Because I remember thinking so at the time good. it was the shit. Because <laughs> the it was like this really hot lady who turns into a fucking, <laughs> like a cat. Is this? Oh, no, that's not. That's oh, this is yeah, this is a movie about crazy people yeah. who live with too many cats. <laughs> that is it. Eighty two. Yeah. yeah that, now on Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. That was her. Do you remember Blu-ray? That was. The I do. Oh, man. Uh, they, they still exist. Do they? People who have home theaters buy Blu-ray. So My she backs up. Uh-oh. I can't. I can't make out with you because I'm a fucking cat. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I've actually what's never wrong? seen this. This the guy's is like, what's wrong? Why are you scared of me? She's like, bitch, I'm gonna eat you. <laughs> it's blood. Malcolm McDowell. Yeah. Wow. So oh shit. Oh, she just that turns into quick. it. That was it. <laughs> oh, no. oh no, no, here she comes. Uh oh. Oh, she's gonna take her clothes off. Woo! He's, she's looking at him. That looked like Faber. Oh, the the woman taking her clothes oh, off, shit. looking, looking back. <laughs> Nineteen eighty-two was so corny. Oh, dude! So, oh, look, the look, guy the- breaks through. Oh, and she's a cat. <laughs> oh boy, this is so dumb. Oh my god. So wait, she's is he not, is he one too? I guess he's a cat too. I don't remember. Yikes. They're gonna they're gonna breed. I like want to see the transformation. They might have skipped it. Oh, it has to be a trend. 
Maybe there's no transformation. That might have been too bad. They just skipped it. <laughs> I feel like all these movies back then were kind of the same. Like, do you remember Silver Bullet? That was another. Yes, another Stephen one. King. Yeah, they Silver know. Bullet. Yeah. We had obviously American Werewolf in London. It wouldn't be in the trailer. Let me find this. I, I guess so. It real quick, hold on. It might not have had a scene. It might have been. I loved all those types of movies. Man. <laughs> I fucking loved them. I did too. But yeah. they're, they're so bad when you watch them oh, now. They're horrible. Silver yeah. Bullet was so terrible. It's so got bad. It. But got it. You got it. Oh, it is. There is a transformation. Oh, she's washing her hands. Too. I'm gonna skip ahead a little. Yes. Whoa. That's on YouTube. Holy shit. They're showing Titai on YouTube. How are they showing Titai? I don't know. Someone missed it. Yeah, did did you show that on the screen? No, no, no. Thank We're not you. watching it. Thank We're getting God. big fucking trouble. Really? Oh, our hands. That's a solid minute of tit. A solid tit minute. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yeah, What's I... going to happen? Come on, let's get going. Oh, she's with a regular white dude. That guy's fucked. Right, oh, oh, here she here goes. Claws. Uh, she's oh, she's showing sweaty. more titty. Super oh, important. Yep. Oh, okay. The brows are changing. The eyeballs, yep. right? The bra- oh. oh, here we go. She What's doesn't... happening? This is like an excuse to show her tits. Yeah. Whoa, the face. Oh, man. Ooh, it's kind of creepy. Dude, this is great. I bet she's going to do that and then immediately be a cat. Yeah. I bet they're going to turn away. Oh, the claws. Oh, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. And, and he's my... sleeping. Oh, what a oh sucker. dude, it's oh, just the like back. American Werewolf in London. Oh, the titties are going away. Oh. Come on. <laughs> Oh, oh, dude, that's brutal. Oh, it comes Whoa. out of the skin. She popped out of the skin. Get off oh, me. it's wrestling with him? Get off me. This is my biggest fear. I'm waking up in my tent for this. And it just runs away. Dude, that's awesome. Well, what a whack movie. Oh, dude, that's crazy. This movie's whack. <laughs> I've never even heard of it. The crazy life. thing is, it like it seems like she's changing, and then it bursts out of her. Yeah, and it's like uh, a cat. Her yeah. skin just goes away. They didn't think there's that a cat inside of her. Well. well, you know, it's like 1982 special effects. Pop. Look at. Yeah. Uh, like it bursts. Ah! The fucking uh, cat comes out. Blah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a gorilla at first. There's no better scene, a transformation scene than American Werewolf. Oh, dude, I, no I love it. When just the guy's like, like yeah, lying on the floor of that just, girl's apartment. Yeah, extend ah, out. His fucking yeah. back is popping, all the hair is uh-huh. coming out. It's the best. Oh, yeah. I had Rick the Baker on the podcast. Mm-mm. Yeah, I had I him on. It. Oh, my God. It was amazing. I'm going to have to watch that. It was so cool just to, to just be around that guy. I, I <laughs> worshipped him when I was a kid. I wanted to be a makeup artist at one point in time really? when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to do special effects for monster movies. I was like, That's that cool. guy is so cool. Like yeah. all the, the stuff that he did for Star Wars and, I mean, so many films, man. That is awesome. So many movies that guy did special effects for. But, but yeah, man, those kind of animals, whether it's big cats or wolves, and there's something about them. Like, I'm glad they exist. It's it's something dope about running into one. You know, I've only seen mountain lions a couple times. I saw one in the distance in Colorado, and uh-huh. one um, when I was in um, Santa Barbara. I was in Montecito, and no we were way. driving. And I saw one run across the street. Oh shit! Yeah, at night. At first, I thought it was a coyote, and then I saw the, the, the tail. tail. I was like, oh, my God, look at his fucking tail. Mm. That's a cat. Mm. Oh! Yeah, that's crazy. And I realized they're, it was a mountain lion. They're crazy. I've only seen a handful in the wild, and they give me the chills every single time. They're amazing. Yeah. I'm glad they're real, but uh, that would be a suck way to go. <laughs> yeah. Do you see that recently, that video of like, the hiker? I yeah, mean, we it played like, it a yo, bunch yeah. of times. Like, wop, 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 just yeah. like, smack it. I would have shit. Oh my God. I would have been done. Yeah. And he was like, what the fuck? <laughs> fuck <Yeah>. you. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Wish I had a gun. <laughs> yeah. it's. Uh, oh, but that man. was another case of a, a mama and her cubs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just, you don't fuck with a mama and her cubs. Yeah. Man. He's really lucky that's all she did, you mm-hmm. know, instead of just tagging him. Oh, yeah. She just, was like, just get out of here. his fucking but, face off. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> She's really lucky. He's yeah. really, really, really lucky. Yeah. And the way, But the way it ran at him with the paws. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he just smacked, bop, 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 bop. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know they did that. I've never seen one do that, and I don't want to. <laughs> I guess you only see it right before you die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that's probably why we haven't seen it yeah. before. Like, all you ever see is, like, them moving slowly. Mm-hmm. Unless you're watching. There's some pretty cool trail cam footage of them jacking deer. Yeah, I've seen you know? some of those. Oh, my God. Deer's drinking out of a guzzler. Yep. And wham! Yeah. Just smacks it. Fast and hard. Just uh-huh. come in on them. Damn. They're uh, they're amazing animals, but again, yeah. that's one of the things that you appreciate about the wild when you're out there is that like, if you didn't exist, 
this is how it all goes down. Mm -hmm. It's wolves and bears and mountain lions and deer and elk and all these animals trying to survive. And it's just, it's a magical place, man. I wish more people would experience it. And I'm I'm really glad that someone like you um, has this service with fins and feathers where you'll take people out that don't have any experience whatsoever in that world and you can introduce it to them. I mean, what a fucking, for a fan, like what a great (laughs) thing to be able to hang with you for a week and to be able to be introduced to the wild. Yeah, yeah. If we can basically teach them enough to be able to provide for themselves for the rest of their life, like that's, for me, that's awesome. It's you pretty know, dope. It's pretty fucking cool. So so your website for that is, how do people get to it? Uh, finsandfeathers.com, and we spell fins and feathers with a Z. What are you, wacky? What's I going know. On? Well, somebody else had the other one, and they wouldn't sell it to us. So, D- what is on there? I don't, who knows? I've never even looked. But oh, really? Yeah. Well, don't go to the one with the S. Yeah. No if you S's. Go we want Z's. Hang with Chad Mendez. You need the Z's. <laughs> Fins and feathers. Yeah. I know. And then uh, peak refuel. And then yep. your almond beef is your. Company. So what was uh, those almond beef? Is like they're just eating almonds, or they? Yeah. So basically, what we do here is kind of the the thought of the reasoning why we started this company is we. We were kind of talking about it earlier like people you know wanting at least for me i get hit up a ton from people like dude i see all the elk that you got or the deer can i buy some and it's like i can't legally sell you any wild game plus i don't know you i'm not going to just ship you a bunch of meat but how i was like how can we create something like in the beef industry that is as close as we can possibly get to the health benefits of wild game and so we basically take these cows most of them Angus, we do some Angus cross and pasture raise, no hormones, no antibiotics, uh, no soy, no corn. We pasture raise them the last 150 days. We basically feed these steers, our proprietary blend of feed, which is almonds. I mean, my team's probably not going to want me to say this, but I think this is probably one of our most important selling points on the beef, but is the healthy diet that they're eating. But it's almonds, the almond hole, which is like that fuzzy part on the outside, mm-hmm. tons of fiber, tons of protein, tons of fat, obviously from an almond. Um, we got sunflower seeds, the shells, um, prune, prune pit, mm. beet pulp, like the pulp from the skin and all that stuff. Uh, brown rice. So when they polish brown rice to make it white rice, they take all that healthy stuff off of it. We throw all that shit in there. Um, and then we do like alfalfa and then some type of roughage, like a barley hay or something like that. So like I said, no soy, no corn. Um, and that's that feed, which is super high octane, high in fat, high in protein, high in carbohydrates is all we feed them for the last hundred to 150 days, which basically we were kind of testing all this out over the last year or so. And just seeing the type of marbling it's given this beef, it's, you know, obviously leaving them super tender meats. Phenomenal. I, I got some out. Go ahead and try it and see what you think. But it's, yeah, I'm really interested in yeah, trying it. The fat on it has like almost like a buttery, nutty flavor from because of the almonds. Yeah, oh. it's it's really good. And do they have like the dark texture to the meat, the same like grass fed beef does? Yeah. Yep. We got um, and it, it you know it it varies. I, our meat is frozen, so basically what we do is um, we it's frozen. It's basically like a butcher box or something like that where you can go on and mm. order whatever cuts you want on our website and then it shows up frozen on your doorstep when it's not frozen. Like if you get that beef and it's fresh off, it's so dark. It's like that really rich looking stuff. But obviously once it freezes, you know, you lose a little bit of that, but, um, yeah, man, it's, it's something that's unique. It's different. We wanted to do something that was healthier in the beef world. You know, obviously it's not quite wild game and I can't sell wild game, but we wanted to create something that was healthier in that sense that where, People can go online. They can feel confident knowing, like, you know, these are humanely raised. They don't have a ton of shit pumped in them. Right. And they're eating a good diet, you know. And this is all family or family-owned uh, operations. Like our, so it's me and four other buddies that started this. And like one of our guy, one of our guys is one of the biggest almond growers in Northern California. So we get a lot of our almonds from him, which is cool. You know, it's all family-owned. The, the Merlot family. Um, and then, you know, the other two guys that are part of it have been in the cattle industry their whole lives. So they know that world like the back of their hand. And then uh, me and my good buddy, Chad Belding, he's um, the owner of and the host of Foul Life TV on the Outdoor Channel. So me and him are kind of, you know, obviously the people that are just letting people know about this stuff. And so, you know, it's been, we launched at the beginning of the year. It's been a ton of work. 
I mean, fuck, I'm sure. I, I never thought I was going to be in the beef industry, but <laughs> it's like, holy fuck. But so what is the website? How do people find it? AmericanAlmondBeef.com. Okay. Um, and they're all going to make fun of me because they call them almonds. I don't know if you ever heard these guys. Northern California, they say They call almond. them almonds? Almonds. They really? Sh- they shake the L out of them is what they say. It's I don't know. It's Ameri- Really? Yeah, they call them American am- almond, like a handful of almonds. What? what all the farmers call it that. Yeah. Have what? you ever heard that? Yeah. That's like- uh, <laughs> you, you ever heard people call acorns acor- acorns? No. Acorns? Yeah. It's like a south thing. Same. Yeah. It's weird. I almonds. say almonds. Yeah. It's an almond, it's you an fucks. <laughs> Cut the shit. American almond beef. Imagine if you say, yeah, we run a company called American Almond Beef. You're like, what the I, fuck is an almond? I searched Google yeah. for almonds, and it's telling me almonds. almonds. <laughs> it says, yeah. how do you say yeah. the word? And there's a bunch of articles uh-huh. talking about that. So it is only a it's Northern a, California I think thing? it's just a Northern yes, California, California farmer. California yeah. All the farmers oh. call it that for some reason, and they look at you weird if you say almond. Like, they I, look at I'm, you weird. I'm, yeah. Uh-huh. Like you're an outsider yeah. for saying it right. Well, either way, I'm sure the beef yeah. is delicious. I can't wait to try it out. But, but uh, thanks for being here, brother. I appreciate yeah, it. I'm glad I we finally did this. It. And uh, good luck in your fight. Uh, so you. October 22nd, is October that what it is? October 22nd. Yep. And that'll be on Bare Knock. Did They do pay-per-view, right? So it's They on, do, yeah. And I think it's kind of similar to the UFC. Like you download an app. I think you can do stuff I think from it's, the it's app. It's the fight app, right? F-I-T-E? Yeah. I, is yep. that what it is? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Glory uses that too, yeah. I think. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank all right, you brother. So much, and uh, Chad Mendez on Instagram, yep. Twitter, yep. all those things, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. And we, so we have the, yeah, we're all, we're all there. You guys can Chad Mendez on, and it's with an S. A lot of people think it's with a Z. So only fins yeah. and feathers yeah, with, the only with the Z. Yeah, with a Z. All right, brother. But thanks yep. for being here, man. Thank Appreciate you so much, man. Bye, everybody. It.